This is my channel's monthly compendium for the month of December 2023. Enjoy and Merry Christmas. Case file number 1365, written by Burlier Quill, Dragonfly 813. A few years back, my grandfather passed away and my mother used a symbol of a dragonfly as a sign that he was with her. Anytime she saw a dragonfly, she knew he was with her. Flash forward a few years and my sister moves off to college and her room number is 813. I don't think anything of it until the following year when I moved off to college, a different school should add, and get the same room number 813. Finding this interesting, my mom looks up the number 813 to see what it means and sure enough, 813 is the number of the dragonfly, something to do with how the numbers form a dragonfly. Even more insane is that I moved in before my roommate, so I got to pick my side of the room and the side I ended up choosing had a tiny little dragonfly pushpin left in the corkboard from the previous residence. I tend not to get caught up in things like this, but I truly could not find even the slightly logical explanation for any of this. Case file number 1366, written by AMLT, 1983. Ghosts of Relationships Past, Present, and Future. I'll start off with, I don't believe in ghosts or spirits or alien abductions or missing time and any of that, but I was in college and in a long distance relationship with my girlfriend in another state. We tried to make it work, but I broke up with her. While it was the correct decision, I didn't handle it correctly, and I knew I broke her heart. I worked at a small hardware store when I was in high school, and I went back to grab something in electrical, and someone grabbed my hand. Somehow, immediately, I was visited by three spirits essentially, like Scrooge, ghost of girlfriend, past, present, and future. I saw my girlfriend crying when I broke up on the phone with her in her dorm room, what she said, what color her bedspread was, everything. Years later when we met up and I asked about when we broke up and I told her I could complete her sentences about what happened, stuff no one except her knew. Girlfriend's present and future visits. I don't recall much of the present, I think I saw her slowly moving on, but the future was spot on of her marrying like an air force pilot, adopting a deaf child from China and living in Hawaii, like spot on exactly what happened. When I was left from the visitors, I was back on that aisle and my bosses thought I had left two hours ago because no one had seen or heard from me. When they checked the camera at my request, only cameras were on the main aisles, they saw me walk into the aisle and two hours later walk out of that aisle. No footage of me for two hours leaving it or anyone else going on that aisle before me or during the missing time. I think about this a lot. Bonus file written by Rubber Soul 93 The Whispering Pines About six years ago, I was at my boyfriend's house, now fiancé. He lived in a secluded area down a dirt road. There were other houses but his property was very private and surrounded by trees and woods and houses were not very close together. You could only ever see the closest neighbor's house through the trees during fall and winter after the leaves fell. The house and property never really felt welcoming. I'm not sure how to explain exactly but I never enjoyed being outside there even though it was a beautiful and quiet place. There was a large deck but we never used it. There were woods all around the house and in the woods was a weird pond that the dogs would sometimes play in. I went to the pond only once, just me and the dogs. There was a foot trail to the pond and while walking it, I saw what appeared to be very long human hair on the ground. I thought it was strange but continued to the pond. When I got there, the water was completely black and I didn't think the dogs should play in it anymore so I tried to call them back but they wouldn't come. That was also strange because the dogs were always so well behaved and always came when I called them. I went about my day not thinking much more about this particular incident, but I still continued to think about the pond and the woods and the strange feeling I got while I was there, but I would always brush it off. Later on in our relationship, I ended up moving in with him. It was very dark out there at night and there were no floodlights. It was a manufactured home that sat on a foundation and the windows and doors were probably about 8 feet off the ground. We were huge night owls and worked swing shifts and it was 2 am on a week night when this happened. We had the bedroom window open and it had no screen 
We didn't have air conditioning, and we lived in the south at the time, so it was hot during the summer. Anyways, we were just hanging out and had some music playing, and I was sitting on the bed with my legs crossed, back facing the window. My fiancé is sitting at a small table facing me. Suddenly, the hair on my arms stand up, and I get goosebumps all over my body. My fiancé randomly stands up, and all I can hear next is footsteps outside, like someone running towards the window and getting close fast. I stood up so fast and screamed. I don't know why I screamed, but I did. I felt an overwhelming sense of dread and fear. By the time I was standing up and had turned around, the curtains were flying around like a strong gust of wind was blowing them. But it was so still and quiet outside that night and there was no wind. The curtains settled almost immediately and all was silent again. We both saw it, both felt it, and couldn't explain it. We have only talked about it twice, the night it happened and the next day. We've never spoken about it again and it still scares the crap out of me. I've only lived there for 8 months before we moved out of state, but thinking back on it now, I don't think we were ever alone out there. Case file number 1367, written by Binary Inc. My friend vanished into thin air right in my living room. I had a friend over last night. We ran into each other earlier in the day and we made plans to have dinner together. She comes over and we hang out on the couch for around an hour just chatting and whatnot. I stand up because I get a phone call, so I go into my bedroom for around 10 to 15 minutes. I go back out and she's not there anymore. Okay, so she's in the bathroom, right? I sit on the couch to wait for her, but she doesn't come out. I go check on her. The bathroom is empty. Now I'm weirded out. Did she leave for no reason? I didn't hear the door open or close and I have a pretty heavy door. I even went outside into the hallway to check if she was there for some reason, but she just promptly disappeared. So now I'm thinking she left for whatever reason, so I called her. It rings for a while and she picks up. Immediately I think it's weird. If she left my flat, she should be on the street, but it's very quiet wherever she is and she sounds like she just woke up. I asked her why she left my flat and she had no idea what I was talking about. I get frustrated and ask where she is. I'm at home taking a nap. Your phone call woke me up. I could hear rustling sheets and as I said, there's no way her side of the phone call would be so quiet if she just left my flat. I live in a busy area. I request to video call her and there she is, in her home, in her bed. She has no makeup on, she's in her PJs looking confused and her eyes are still kind of puffy from sleep. I asked her if she remembered coming to my flat. She looked confused. Did we make plans today? She said that after running into me, all we did was chat, say goodbye, and then she went home to take a nap. Obviously, there's no way she got home, removed her makeup, undid her hair, changed her clothes within 15 minutes of my place. She lives like half an hour away from me. I have no clue what to think of it. Case file number 1368, written by Monia. My kid's backpack disappears in broad daylight. I took my son with me to the office yesterday because he didn't have school that day. He brought his backpack with snacks and his phone inside it. He was carrying the backpack with him when he left the house. I made sure he had it because his phone charger and all the stuff he needs is in there. We get to the office, he takes his jacket off, sits by one of the computers and places the backpack beside him. I've seen him going on his phone which was in the backpack. Later around 3 p.m. We couldn't find his backpack. We panicked because we thought somebody stole it and his phone was inside it. We asked around the office and they didn't see it after 3 p.m. but they remembered him having the backpack that morning. We kept looking and couldn't find it. We realized it probably got stolen when he wasn't looking. There were a lot of kids coming in and out for trick or treating. We leave the office and go home. I unlock the house, I go in my room and his backpack is sitting on the bed with all his stuff inside it, including his phone which he used yesterday. There are texts and a couple of social media interactions he made using the phone so we know he had both the backpack and the phone that day. We are shocked. We try to rationalize it as much as possible but there is no way he never brought it with him. There's concrete proof that he did such as eyewitnesses, him seeing it, him going on his phone, me seeing it, other people seeing it and the sent texts alongside other social media interactions that couldn't have been possible without him having the phone. 
This is the first time something like this has ever happened to me. I don't know how to feel about it. Case file number 1369, written by Pixie Yogi 81 The Vanishing House on Portobello Street. I do dog boarding and dog sitting. I was driving to a client's house for the fourth time in two days. It's near my neighborhood, so the area isn't super unfamiliar. I'm not under the influence or tired. Their road is Portobello, house number 53. My GPS tells me to turn and I do so, verifying a street sign. I began looking for the wreath on the door that I have been using to identify the house. I don't see it. I turn around, roll down my window and start looking at house numbers. Number 49, number 57? Wait, what? I missed the house. But they're all right next to each other and I was looking carefully at the house signs. I turn around and drive by again. Number 57, number 49. Starting to get shaken, I look around. I see the distinct shrubbery of the house across the street that I'd noticed on my last visit as I was leaving. Drive back by, nothing. No 53. I leave the neighborhood, go back to the main street, turn around and drive back to Portobello. Driving down, number 57, number 53. Right there, plain as day. I call my best friend as I enter the house to talk to me because I'm shaken. She talks to me through the 30 minute visit. As I'm leaving, a huge white wolf looking dog is staring at me from the end of the walkway. My brain starts panicking, which I express to the friend. A guy comes into view and I see he has a leash and is walking the dog, just letting it wander pretty far into this yard. As I'm driving home, the owner texts me. She said it showed on a ring camera when I left, but not when I arrived, and she found this weird as it never happened. I entered and exited through the front door. What the cinnamon toast frick, guys? Case file number 1370, written by Vista Vision. The startling night John Cleese broke the fourth wall. Many decades ago, I was up late watching TV after midnight when a coffee commercial featuring John Cleese came on. Much to my shock, in the middle of the commercial, Cleese leaned forward and screamed or shrieked at the camera. Then he went back to the commercial without acknowledging the scream. It made my heart skip a beat, but then I thought, oh, it's the wacky guy from Monty Python, and it'd be just like him to be in a commercial where he does something like this to freak people out. A week or so later, I saw the same commercial again. I remembered it from before and waited for the scream, but he didn't scream this time. This unnerved me a bit, but then I thought maybe they made two versions of the same commercial just to mess with people. I never saw the scream version ever again. Not entirely unexplainable since I suppose I must have hallucinated it or fallen asleep for two seconds or something, but I wasn't remotely tired and never had any kind of similar experience. I didn't think of it again for decades, then one day a few years ago, it popped into my head and I wondered if I could find the commercials on YouTube. I did a very quick search for John Cleese coffee commercial and it was the first result and just as I remembered it, 1986 Maxwell House coffee but there was only the normal version of the commercial. No screaming. Case file number 1371, written by Sazo 3 The Range Rover That Drove Out of Existence Once, my boyfriend and I were driving to his house. It was probably at least 10pm and the road we drove was basically a road between masses of fields and a few scattered houses. It was wet that night, but was no longer raining. He was driving, and I was just sitting idly talking watching the completely straight road ahead when out of the corner of my eye, I saw something leaving the driveway of a house. I turned to look, I can still remember red taillights, silver alloy wheels, black Range Rover. It was reversing out of the drive. I was so sure it was there that I leaned forward and pointed out the windscreen on his side and said, B, watch out the Range Rover. He looked at me as if I was insane and I met his glance for a second and looked back. There was no car and absolutely nothing in front of my pointed finger. But I saw it like there was a car, I insisted. I know you saw something, but there's nothing there. Glitch? I think so. Case file number 1372, written by Danny Smell. My mother's mysterious intuition thwarts danger. I was a passenger in my mom's car and we were waiting at some traffic lights at a T-junction. The lights stop you a little further back from the edge of the road so you cannot see the traffic around the corner. There's also big hedges that line the path so it's a completely blind corner, very dangerous. 
The lights turn green and my mom doesn't move for a few seconds, leaving the brake on. I ask her if she knows the lights are green. She says yes. A few more seconds pass. I asked her why she isn't going then. The car behind beeps at us to go. She still doesn't move. I ask her if everything is okay when a car suddenly zooms across the road in front of us, obviously going through a red light. I have no idea how fast the car had been going exactly, but I knew it would have done serious damage had it hit us, especially to my mom as it would have hit her side head on had she gone when the lights changed. The thing is, there was absolutely no indication that the car was coming. Where I live, people don't run red lights, especially on that sort of junction. It just doesn't happen. I was baffled. I asked my mom how she knew the car was going to run the red light. She said she didn't. She had no idea. She just had this instinct that told her to wait. To this day, she can't explain it. She just somehow knew at the moment to wait. Bonus file written by Bread 0987654321. The do-it-yourself Ouija experiment. I visited my best friend Peter in Los Angeles in the early 90s. He had a roommate named Tim. My first night there, we started talking about Ouija boards, and I said, I wonder if we could make one. Peter had a cardboard shirt box from a gift I'd sent him, so I made a board complete with numbers, letters, and yes and no, goodbye, and so on. I also made a planchette out of leftover cardboard, and the board worked. Tim was super drunk and thought Peter and I were moving the planchette, so I asked how I could convince him we weren't. He told me to go in the bathroom and write down a word. Then they'd ask the board what the word was. Okay, cool. I closed the bathroom door and wrote up cup on a small piece of paper, put it in my pocket and went back out. Tim and Peter did the board and asked what the word was, and it spelled out cup. Then I showed the word. I was having a legit panic attack at that point. Peter and I freaked out while Tim screamed we'd planned the whole thing, but it was his idea. We burned the board and I've never messed with one again. Case file number 1373, written by Matt Scott Style, baby. Wisconsin's Whispering Grove. I was bikepacking with some buddies in the north woods of Wisconsin. It was early winter, but not very snowy, just cold. We were about three days into our trip, and it was getting near dusk. So we decided to go off the trail a little bit and look for a spot to set up camp. The sun is setting. That's where things got weird. Very, very weird. We saw an area that was in a sort of mini valley, grove, just some little hills, about 10 feet each, and trees on top of them. It was early winter, with barely any snow on the ground. When we started to bike to the grove, the snow started to thicken a lot. It went from two inches of snow to six, then eight, then a foot. There were mostly evergreens and a few trees whose leaves hadn't fallen off all the way yet. We had to walk our bikes through it. We all wanted to turn back and find a different spot. But we had to get to where we were going. It's a biking thing. <laughs> as soon as I thought about turning around, I started to think about how nice that mini valley was. It was like something else thinking for me. Kind of like when you're just a little bit drunk. My buddies all kind of just looked at each other as if we all had weird vibes. We pushed onward to the grove. Then it started to get very sunny and warm. But the snow stayed about a foot. It wasn't melting at all. We didn't really notice it at first until my friend, let's call him Jeff, took off his coat. It was like when you hear someone say, don't itch your face, and then your face itches. Basically, we all noticed how hot we were and started to sweat, like we were warm, on the inside, but not the outside. It's really hard to describe. When we got to the area, we heard leaves blowing in the trees. It sounded much too loud to be from the last few leaves on the oaks and maples. It's early winter, and the closest evergreen was like a hundred feet away, and these leaf sounds were right above us. I started to get a really bad feeling about it. It was like we aren't supposed to be here feeling. Most of my buddies didn't notice. But my friend, who we'll call Eric, gave me a look that said, You feel that too? We set our gear down and our bikes up against a tree and settled down for a bit and played some games. But after a while, it started to get dark. So we set up our tents, our little fold-up stove, and our gear. We talked and drank and smoked some ciggies, 
we were all having a good time for several hours. My friend Eric recommended that we should get some sleep because of how late it was. We went into our tents and settled down for the night. Or they did. There were two tents and three people in a tent. This is where it got scary. Damn right spooky freaking crap. After everyone was asleep, I woke up with a startle. I had a feeling that I was being watched. I felt very vulnerable. After about five minutes of laying there, I heard some animals running around the tents. After another five minutes, I got annoyed. I sat up in my sleeping bag and unzipped the window flappy thing that covers the mesh window and I saw some coyotes. Okay, no big deal. We're six on four. So I quietly zip up the window flappy thing and try to get back to sleep. I can't sleep. I wasn't worried about the coyotes, but I knew something else was out there. I had a terrible gut feeling. I felt like I had liquid fear in my veins. That's the only way to describe it. Then I heard a yelp and a whine. Then a second later, a soft thump. I heard the little coyote's feet running away. It took me a second to register what could have done something like that. Then it clicked, and I was like, oh crap, oh frick man, oh damn, that's not how things work. I realized that something must have kicked it big. There was an absolutely disgusting smell, like mildew, burnt milk, and body odor. I thought it was a bear or something, so my dumbass, save me a lecture, grabbed the can of bear spray that I kept in my bag and grabbed my pistol. I unzipped the tent as fast as I could and froze in place. I couldn't move. Like physically not able to move. Not because of fear. I don't know exactly what the hell it was. But the creature was doing it. What I do know is this. It was not a bear. It stood up. It stared at me for like three minutes straight. Whatever it was, it was chiseled as hell. Skinny, yet chiseled. Its eyes were black, with blue pupils. Its head was like the shape of an upside down sock but its cranium jiggled a little when it stood up. It was tall, like maybe 15 feet tall. No hair, lanky and skinny. Its skin was in between tan or opaque, but very smooth and shiny. It had long arms, long legs. It was humanoid, that's for sure. But its limbs were oddly proportioned compared to a human, almost dog-like. Or cat-like. Its neck was like a foot long, but it looked layered like gills, but made out of skin. It breathed kind of raspy, like an old smoker. It had long curly fingers, no fingernails, or none that I saw. They just came to a tip, like a pencil tip. Its mouth was circular. I could understand what it was thinking. I could not hear its thoughts, more like its intentions. I hope that makes sense. I couldn't move because it didn't want me to move. It was studying me. It knew what I was thinking. It knew I was going to shoot at it. It didn't want us to leave. It just wanted to be safe and trusted. It was lonely. It let me go after about 30 seconds. I just sat down on a rock while I stared at it. No matter what, I could not break eye contact with it. I didn't feel like I was in danger. But after its heavy neck breathing and creepy eye contact, I heard a soft, almost anime voice type of whisper in both ears and it said, Green is the color of life. Matt Scott style, baby. Then it looked at me for confirmation, blinked, then said, Okay, bye, now. Then it closed its eyes. While I did this, I felt like there were green eye drops in my eyes. As soon as its eyes opened again, the green wash was gone, and it took off into the woods ridiculously fast, like 30 miles per hour. There was a line of kicked up snow that followed the creature where it went, but no footprints. I didn't dare follow it. I didn't know what it was, but I slept very well that night. When I woke up, my buddy Jeff, who was in the other tent, had said he had a dream that perfectly described the whole thing. He said he felt like it was real. I told him it was and explained it from my point of view. Everything was fairly normal after that, aside from guttural screeching in the middle of the night and me and Jeff being thoroughly spooked. Case file number 1374, written by Deanna Chick. The harrowing tale of the abyss and the hand of God. Okay, without all the details, because the story would be even longer. I almost drowned when I was vacationing in Hawaii years ago. Not a strong swimmer, and the water gets pretty choppy. So much so that they put no surfing signs up. 
As we were driving by on a tour of the island in a rented car, I wanted to stop. There were a few people in the water, and I thought it looked funny, so I got in for a few minutes and it was fun. Suddenly, I realized there was no one in the water and the tide had pulled me out quickly. I quickly found myself in trouble. I kept trying to swim back to shore, but I was getting pulled out further and further by the tide. Then my boyfriend was on the beach laughing. I was screaming every time my head came above water. He told me he thought I was playing around, but I know he was afraid of the ocean and sharks, and I just knew that's why he didn't try to help. Each time I tried to swim to shore, the tide pulled me out further. Eventually, I was completely exhausted and my arms and legs felt like rubber and I just couldn't swim anymore. I just held my breath and started sinking. As I was sinking, I looked around watching the sun on the surface start to disappear and all the particles around me. I then looked down into the blackness of the ocean and I remember thinking that I can't freaking believe this is how I'm going to die. It was surreal. Then, the thought of my boyfriend standing on the beach laughing came into my head and I realized, this is the jerk that's going to tell my mother I'm dead. I got a surge of energy and started swimming to the surface. I got to the top and started swimming furiously towards the shore, I almost made it, but then I got dragged back out again. But I kept swimming and suddenly it felt, and I swear to god, it felt like the hand of god scooped me up. And like a bowling ball, I was hurled with the next massive wave to the shoreline. I dug my fingers into the sand as the waves started to pull back and crawled a couple feet and lay there for about 10 minutes. As my then boyfriend came over and said, hey, are you okay? No, I freaking wasn't. I had a bikini and a pair of shorts and a t-shirt on when I went in. Came out with my bikini bottoms and a t-shirt. It took me about 30 minutes to stop shaking. I swear to this day it was a hand of God. Case file number 1375, written by Friendly Coconut, The Magic Uber Ride. I don't have a car and had to take an Uber home from a rehearsal for a theater production because buses don't run that late. I've done it a zillion times. The Wi-Fi is a little patchy there though, but luckily I have my home address saved in the app. One night, I was riding home when the Uber driver made a wrong turn, then another. Then I suddenly recognize we're going in the opposite direction of my house. I look at the app and it's showing a totally different address from mine, across the county. About a 20 minute drive from my home. It's an Uber pool, so it won't let me change the destination. I can only assume that, since the Wi-Fi was poor, it input the wrong address. Both started with a 5, but I was sure I hit the home button on the app. As we get closer to the random destination, I didn't recognize anything. I'd never been in this part of town before and I worried that it would be someone's house and I'd have to wait in their driveway until a new Uber arrived. To my surprise, however, it was a large, well-lit shopping center. I was able to pop into the grocery store and get some food while waiting for a new Uber. When I ordered the new Uber, I saw that somehow this new strange address had been set as home on my phone. A year later, I was preparing to move out of my parents' place and move in with my boyfriend. He said he found a great one and got an appointment to tour it, so I tagged along. As we drove to the apartment complex, I saw that same mysterious shopping center that my Uber had taken me to a year ago. It was right across the street from the apartment. I've now lived there for a year and a half and I love it here. I feel like there was something almost supernatural in this shopping center being randomly listed as home on my phone. Bonus file written by Jenguin as Frick. When puppies break the laws of physics. I had just gotten a new pug puppy. Literally could sit in my normal adult female sized hand. Tiny. Had another elderly pug that was sitting next to me on the couch while the baby was roaming around the living room. I threw a toy about 8 to 10 feet away and went back to my phone. It was a small stuffed toy. The only reason it went that far was the arc I got. It had very little weight to it. A moment or two later, I'm smacked in the face, sitting on a couch so about 4-5 to five feet off the ground, with the toy. I look over and the puppy is a solid few feet in the opposite direction of where the toy landed, next to the dining room table. Problem number one. No way that Pudgeball could have teleported a few feet away from the spot of the toy in a second or two if she had actually been by the toy in the first place. Problem 2. 
I'm embarrassed to say I actually tested this by getting down and trying to recreate it. There was no way a being of her size had the ability to fling that toy 8 to 10 feet across the room at the velocity it hit my face. I did my best dog impression of swinging it right and left, and only got it a foot or two. I did everything I could to recreate it, but I just couldn't. And if a grown adult doesn't have the power or motor ability, there is no way a pug who weighed less than a pound and was still learning to trot without falling over on her face could have gotten over there, flung the toy with enough force to actually smack me in the face noticeably, and then run off to another spot and act confused. Case file number 1376, written by Notorious War, the Spectral Alien of Edinburgh. It's September 1st, 2020. I'm back home. My stepfather was going through the end stages of really bad cancer. Unfortunately, he passed about a year ago now, and I'm there helping take care of him. As my mother had also passed just six months before this. It's been a bad couple of years for my brother and I, but into the actual story. It's been a very long day for me. My father is fading fast, and his medications are providing little respite to him, and it just feels like there's little we can actually do to help. I've made it very, very clear to my brother and remaining family, if this sort of thing ever happens to me, to be kind and let me go, or if needed, help me find a way to end my suffering, as it's not living, it's just existing. It's getting to about 2.15am, and I'm stressed out but not tired, and I decide to step out for a smoke, onto the wraparound balcony of the building my parents' house is in. It's a 22-story building, and there are 11 up. It's in Edinburgh, Scotland the very north of the city. Edinburgh is a very green city, plenty of grass and trees, many of them over 150 years old and tall and strong. I'm on the balcony, leaning on the railing, smoking away, thinking of nothing, enjoying the early morning air. The morning is cool and fresh, with no trace of breeze, and the promise of a lovely day. As I stand there, my gaze roves over the streets below, the estuary of the fourth river less than three miles away, and I'm just daydreaming and kind of vacant, and my gaze passes over a nearby tree, a tree I've seen so many times I no longer even see it. I barely register its presence at all, even though this tree is actually just as tall as the landing I'm on, and probably only 15 to 20 meters from the building at the nearest point, and my brain sort of nudges my mind to tell me something is off. I look again, and it occurs to me that one of the upper branches, maybe about 30 centimeters wide, is sort of bending downwards at a strange angle, like there's weight on it. I scan along and there's no reason for this that I can see at all. I stand straight, no longer leaning on the railing, and all the hairs on my arms and the back of my neck raise up and I get that being watched feeling. My heart starts to race a little and the adrenaline rushes through my system, and yet I can see nothing to cause this, but I most definitely feel there's something wrong here. As the hairs all stand up, I'm taking a more thorough look at everything in my direct vicinity, and I see it. There's like a slight sort of haze, about three-fourths of the way along that branch, I noticed. I remember tilting my head, just the way you see a dog do when it's looking at you, trying to work out what you're doing. And as I'm staring, trying to distinguish if I'm just tired or what, it moves. What resolves in front of me, less than 20 meters, is a large humanoid outline, far too large to be supported by the branch it seems to be on. I say to myself, what the frick? But I don't get to finish the thought, as I hear a sound and the thing goes from crouched to fully standing, and is well over 7 feet tall, and I'm 6 foot 1 myself, so not short, and it's very easy to see this is very much bigger, not just taller, bigger in every way. It's still just outline and haze, but the noise it makes as it moves, when it's realized it's been seen, I swear, is the exact sound you hear when you watch a Predator film. The long, drawn-out click, 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 in rapid succession. This thing takes two or three steps along the branch, parallel to the balcony I'm on, and then it simply steps off the branch and drops. I try to follow it as it descends, and as I lean forward and look down, I see a neighbor directly on the level below me, about 5 feet to the right, also watching this thing plummet. I lose sight of it about 15 to 20 feet from the ground, but as it hits, there's a thump and dust and dirt billows from the impact. 
There's also a woman not too far from the point of impact, and she spins around surprised and shocked at the sound. By the time the dust and stuff is dissipating, there's no sign of whatever it was. But I'm still leaning over the railing and ask the neighbor below if he just saw what I saw and he confirms it. And I asked what did he specifically see? And he hesitated and said it looked like a heat ripple on the shape of a human, but way bigger. But it was the noise that drew his attention initially. I stand there for maybe 25 minutes trying to see if there's any sign at all I can see, but there's nothing. The following day, I actually managed to speak to the woman below, as she was a local resident, and she said she saw nothing at all, just a huge thump and then dust spreading out. But she heard the clicking. I was always a skeptic to these things, but there was no way that was a human using advanced tech. Why would anyone use it in a populated city if it was some secret development and it was just too large, and no human could survive an 11th floor drop and just vanish? It's made me really look at the world in a different way, and even in a busy city midday, I keep my eyes and ears open to see what's really there, not just autopilot my way through the day, seeing around me just what I expect to see, because you never know. Case file number 1377, written by User Unknown Skag. The night the stars went silent and the forest screamed. A couple years ago, a good buddy and I went up to the place my folks had recently bought to check on construction progress. In reality, sight in a new rifle and get a bit drunk. After a couple of hours, we're hanging out at the end of an as yet unpaved driveway, working our way through a few cold ones. When a random truck rolls up the driveway, out pops a guy with a children of the corn vibe and a middle management dress sense. We were just relieved at first that he didn't appear to be a cop. He says hi, introduces himself vaguely, and starts asking pretty pointed questions about us personally. How much we paid for the place, what the plans for the land are, 80 acres in the middle of nowhere, etc. We answer just as vaguely, albeit politely, offer the guy a beer, and make polite hints he's welcome to clear off at his earliest convenience. Which he does with no great haste. Whatever, people are weird in the country especially when a previous potential buyer wanted to turn the place into an industrial hog farm, apparently. I get being a nosy-ish neighbor, I guess, so we shrug it off and I go back to our beers and decide to make a little campfire as it's getting dark. This is when it starts to get a bit weird. Since he and I both worked a retail job, we had weird days off, and this was the middle of the week, not exactly a party night at the local campground. We start hearing some weird stuff from the houses across the street. They're not close enough that we can see what's going on, but close enough we could hear the sound of people talking at normal volume. Not that weird, right? It's nowhere, no industrial or highway noise sound carries. But we start to realize there's something rhythmic about the sound we're hearing. Not musical, but organized, almost chanting. We're getting a little weirded out. But they're not specifically bothering us, and we're big tough men after all, with a hunting rifle in the trunk, and enjoying a night off with a fire and the stars overhead. Every now and again, we'd hear some animal or other moving thing moving through the tree line behind us, and thought how cool it was to be out in nature. About 10 minutes later, everything goes quiet, completely silent. The weirdos across the road, the forest, even the wind just completely dropped off into nothing. With that silence, we both suddenly felt like we had eyes on us, like we were at the middle of a stadium full of silent fans, all staring unblinkingly directly at the two of us. We didn't even say a word to each other, but at the same time kicked dirt on the fire and grabbed the gun out of its case. We both felt like something was absolutely not right, suddenly. And then we heard a noise. It was faint at first, and then built. Something was running through the trees, crashing around, not caring how much noise it made. Whatever it was ran right to the edge of the tree line and stopped. There are black bears in that area, but they tend to go out of the way to avoid people. We were sweating, barely breathing. It still felt like thousands of people were staring at us. The hair on my arms and the back of my neck were standing on end. It was silent again for a moment, and we thought the stillness was worse than the noise in the trees. Until something screamed. It sounded like a woman being stabbed to death. I've never in all my life heard anything quite like that. And I hope I never do again. It screamed once, and that was all it took. 
I think we called out to see if someone was there, but we were both shaken right down to our core. We jumped back into my car and drove out of there as fast as that beat-up Pontiac could carry us. Case file number 1378, written by Anonymous. The journey of a ring from bleacher to pocket. Here's something that happened to me that was very strange, and I could never explain it. I was sitting on these bleachers with my sister. We were sitting more towards the top. If you were to drop something, it would fall through the steps and you would never see it again because there was a chain fence surrounding the back, so people can't go under the bleachers, if that makes sense. So we were sitting there and we were joking around and started fighting. She was sitting to my left and I was wearing this ring on my right hand. The ring fit me loosely. When I whipped my hand back, the ring flew off my finger and I heard it hit the metal steps of the bleachers to my right. It was my favorite ring. So I turned on my flashlight and tried looking for it, hoping it didn't fall through the steps. Even a lady sitting behind us saw what happened and tried helping me, but we couldn't find it and I realized it must have fallen and I lost it forever. I'm just sitting there bummed out about it for a few minutes. I put my hands into my jacket pockets. I feel something in my right pocket and I pull it out and would you know, it's my ring. I still have no idea how it ended up in my pocket when it clearly flew off my hand several feet to my right and hit the ground, and I never picked it up. I heard the click as it fell and hit the metal bleacher. Not very dramatic, but it's still one of the strangest things that's ever happened to me. Case file number 1379, written by Avor Boy, Whispers of the Dawn. I was in a choir and was super excited for this trip we were taking to San Antonio for a competition. Except I had to wake up really early to get there on time for the bus to show up. I told myself I was going to set an alarm for 5am to make sure I got there in time. But when I went to bed that night, I forgot to set the alarm. I had a weird dream that night. I don't remember exactly what happened, but I remember a lot of whispering and feeling something in the dream getting really, really close to my face, like a wispy, smoky figure of some kind. The whispering kept getting louder and louder until eventually I woke up super tense. Normally when I wake up, I'm a little groggy and it takes me a minute to get out of the bed, but this time around I was fully awake and alert. I laid there for a few seconds, a little freaked out by the dream, then I rolled over to check my phone and see what time it was. It was exactly 5 in the morning. Case file number 1380, written by Karaoke Chameleon. The Phantom Prescription. A few years ago, my 60-year-old mother came to visit me from another state for a couple weeks. She's had a lot of medical issues in the past, so she brought a big bottle of pain pills with her. A few days into the visit, she goes to take her next dose and can't find the bottle anywhere. She always put it in the same spot on the coffee table every time she visited. No one else had entered my apartment, and I didn't have a pet that could have hidden it somewhere. It made absolutely no sense. We spent hours looking for this bottle, under furniture, between cushions, in the freezer, in the trash, to no avail. She was in so much pain and I felt so terrible about it. We were entirely perplexed and weirded out about the whole thing. The next day, she decided to cut the trip short so she could go back to her state and get another prescription from her doctor. A few months later, I was going through some old boxes in the closet and there it was inside a box under two other boxes that hadn't been opened in years. It was a pretty big what the hell moment. Let my mom know I found it and returned it to her when she visited again. Soon after that, she weaned off the pills entirely and didn't need them anymore. Maybe it was a good thing it disappeared that one time. The involuntary detox may have woken her up. Who knows? Weird stuff. Bonus file written by Fox42. Father unleashes spirit magic on skeptical teen. The time my father used spirit magic to answer questions I had written down and kept on me without his knowledge. This happened when I was a late teen. My father had been writing down musings during the evening and they were very metaphysical in nature. Explanations of after death, the other side, that sort of thing. I was skeptical about all this type of stuff so I came clean to my mother about it. To this day she is still very devout in this belief that dad is a medium. She challenged me to go into my room and write down questions. Dad was out working a job at the time. I did as she asked. I locked myself away in my bedroom, hand wrote a bunch of questions I had about the other side and such and folded them up and kept them in my back pocket of my jeans the rest of the day. 
Not much has changed with me in the fact that I mostly just exist at my computer. So I was at my computer until dad got home. Later that night, he comes into my room unannounced and says, Mom said for me to give this to you. On it was written every question I wrote, the same wording I used, with the answers. I still don't really fully believe he was a medium, but I sure as hell questioned consistently after that night. How could he know? Bonus file written by Eddie Brock, Luminous Orbs of the Seaside Woods. Nearly 20 years ago, my best friend and I were camping with my family, a place we had both basically grown up at, so we knew the location quite well. Anyhow, being the delinquents we were, we both left the campsite around midnight to 1am to smoke a joint. We walked around 5 minutes to a park that was on the ocean, with a dense forest jutting up against it. We are on the beach when we finish smoking, and are enjoying the stars for a few minutes when we both notice something about 150 feet up the beach along the forest trail. I still have a hard time describing what we saw. Approximately 6 orbs of light appear on the trail, which runs parallel to the beach. They form in a horizontal line and start moving towards us. These lights are orbs and unlike a flashlight, they do not project any light. No beams like a flashlight, no area like a candle. None of the trees nearby lit up. They were more like white light rather than the orange of a candle. Upon them moving towards us, we are both filled with an immediate sense of dread and decide we're not sticking around. We hightail it out of there. My friend glanced over while we were running perpendicular to the location and he insists he saw them form a circle and hover down to the ground. Upon discussing it for a bit, we go back armed with weapons and flashlights to see and there is nothing to note. I have to repeat that this was not in a location where fireflies reside and even if there was a human element behind these lights, they were moving towards us at a pace people couldn't possibly move through a wooded forest in pitch dark. I'm in my 30s now with a family and whenever I see my friend, we still talk about it and shake our heads trying to just explain it. Case fall number 1382, written by Cran Witch. The unforgettable day a book called my name. I was maybe 11 years old and was walking through a flea market. It was the kind where you could buy real antique paintings or oriental rugs or junk. Mostly I bought vintage costume jewelry. I remember this feeling coming over me of absolute certainty as I walked down an aisle and towards a distant bookstall. I knew that I would walk up and that the book I pulled would have my last name on it. And it happened. The first book I pulled was old, quite small, and bound in a dark green fabric cover. The spine was so weathered that you couldn't read the title anymore. On the front was my last name in aged gold letters, above a pasted on print of a pastoral landscape, all of it framed with embossed gilded foliage. There is no publishing date inside, but a young woman's name handwritten with the date September 23rd, 1914, and the town, Atlanta. I bought it immediately for, I think, $7. I still have it in my smallish collection of antique books. It's too fragile to read, so I bought another modern copy that I also haven't read. <laughs> it's a Victorian novel, a collection of satirical sketches really, about women and small town life. Now that I'm older, I should give it a shot. I have no idea why I was so certain of what I would find. I had no knowledge such a book even existed. Bonus file, written by My Name's Not Chase. The Combat Ready Ghost in My Military Barracks I had just finished my initial military training, basic AIT, a few other classes, and got sent to my first duty station. My unit was at NTC for pre-deployment training, so I met up with the rear echelon. I was issued my room and spent three very disturbed days and nights in the barracks with weird stuff happening like gear not where I left it, locked drawers being opened, the microwave turning on by itself, crap like that. My roommate, who I knew throughout training, showed up on the fourth day and I told him something along the lines of, watch your crap, someone's been messing with my stuff and I don't know who. So the fourth night comes around and myself and my roommate secure our room and gear and go to bed. I gotta be up at 0530 for PT, so it's an early night. We lock all our stuff and go to bed. I woke up around 0100 because my blanket had fallen to the ground 
and I was cold, which was weird, because we were in the south in summer, so it's always hot. I hop down to get my blanket, and I notice my armor is open. So I open the lock, close it, lock it, and get back to bed. I fell back asleep pretty easily, but I woke up again at about 0230, and all my stuff and my roommate's stuff was thrown around the room. I wake up my roommate and he's pissed because someone is messing with us and I can't figure out who it is. We clean it up, lock our stuff and go back to bed, and was not alone. I can hear my roommate snoring, so I know it's not him. I sat up and saw someone in the little kitchenette area with the fridge open looking in it. I was freezing again. I was about to say something as a soldier turned around. My eyes had a moment to adjust to the bright light. And then I started recognizing gear, like the L-shaped flashlight on his shoulder, his Alice pack with magazine holders and canteens, boots and fatigues. This dude was combat ready. As my eyes reached his face, he turned a bit and I could see it. Half his head and helmet were gone, blown off by the looks of it. I'm scared crapless at this point. He closed the fridge, walked across the room keeping his bright green eyes on, opened my front door and walked out. As he exited, he turned back around and said to me, be safe. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. I didn't wake my roommate up. I just sat up in bed for about two hours till I had to get ready for PT. 0630 rolls around, so everyone is outside the barracks in formation getting ready to start PT, and the acting first sergeant says, hey not Chase, you good? Looks like you saw a ghost. Negative, I'm fine. About halfway through PT, he comes up to me and asks me what's wrong because I'm visibly shaken up. I told him I was fine and just couldn't sleep last night. A few others asked if I was okay and I just lied and said I was fine. I really wasn't and they could see that, but they let me be. After PT ended, the acting first sergeant pulled me to the side and told me to speak freely, openly, and with all confidentiality and off the record. What is wrong? I told him that if I told him what happened, he would think I'm bat crap crazy. He assured me it was off the record and once again said, talk to me. You seriously look like you've seen a ghost. That got an awkward chuckle out of me and I began to tell him my story. And when I got to the part about his head, the acting first sergeant lost his crap. Who the hell put you up to this? This is not funny, etc, etc. He smoked me for about 30 minutes. Made me do push-ups, mountain climbers, stuff like that. All the while yelling at me that I'm a piece of crap. Finally, after about 30 minutes of that, he says, Look me in the eye and swear on everything that you love that you're not lying to me. I told him I was not lying. It freaking happened. So he says follow me. So I do. We got to the command office, which I had never been in, and they were obviously locked. He takes me behind three locked doors and three rooms I had never stepped foot in, and when he opened the last door I saw it, it gave me chills. It still gives me chills, but plain as day, there's a soldier's portrait behind the commander's desk. I froze and said, that's him. The acting first sergeant, the guy who assigned me that room, told me who it was. He was a corporal in the unit on my first unit's deployment to Iraq, and he died in an IED attack that took off part of his head. I was the first soldier to be assigned that room since it belonged to the deceased corporal. He forgave me, and I forgave him, and he told me some stories about who this guy was. I deployed with that unit just a couple months later and spent 12 months fighting in that terrible crap hole. I nearly died too. I don't know how many times my vehicle got hit with IEDs and rockets and it always made me think of that corporal. I survived more things than most people can imagine, and I always felt like that corporal was keeping an eye out for me. Not everyone in my unit was as lucky as me. Three from my company didn't get to come home. Case file number 1383, written by Solar Phoenix 0207. The Wolf Guardian's Silent Warning. My family has a history of incredible abilities. Seeing into the future, mediums, sixth sense, heightened sensitivity to spectral activity. The best way to describe what I saw was the equivalent of a wolfish grim reaper. So when I was little, about 8 or 10, I was with my family on a walk around in our urban trailer park. There's one part of a street that is a dead end, leading into the woods. As we passed there to head up that street on our way home, I saw it standing in the trees, 
huge, bigger than any wolf I've ever seen, almost as tall as a person. It had glowing eyes, I think they were white or gold, with a shaggy black coat. It just stared at me with a sad gaze, like it was pitying me. Then my mom called to me and I turned to look at her. When I looked back at the wolf, it was gone. Later that week, mom got a call. Her grandfather had a week to live. His x-rays lit up like a Christmas tree to show many malignant tumors. Even as a young girl, it hit me like a freight train. That wolf was a warning to me somehow. When I spoke to my native studies teacher, a Mi'kmaq elder named Dave, he explained that it may have been a spirit telling me of his passing. He explains that he himself knew spirits as a boy even if he hadn't been connected to his native past and faith at the time. They are especially attracted to children and try to protect and guide them. Wolves are especially seen as protectors, and the animal he saw the most in those spirits were wolves. To this day, I still thank that spirit for helping me, and I asked Dave to reach out to it in his next sweat lodge to thank it only on my behalf. I hope to get into this beautiful culture and gain my spirit name and clan. Bonus File, written by Verano Ete, Decades of Mystery One night, I came home late after everyone went to bed as usual. As soon as I pulled up outside, I had a feeling that someone was in my house. I went upstairs to my room, but I noticed that the bedroom door opposite to mine was closed. It's never closed. I knew someone was in there, so I hurried to my room and closed the door the best I could. I usually turn on the light and fan, but instead I turned on my little nightlight besides my bed. I quickly start to change and get into bed when I hear the door across the hall open. I jumped into bed and turned off the light and pulled the covers up. Now from my bed I had a direct line to my door. The door doesn't usually shut all the way due to cable cords but it won't open back up. I couldn't believe what happened next. A large white male walks out of the bedroom, turns on the stairway light. I could see his skin and the white t-shirt he was wearing. I hear him walk down the stairs, walk through the dining room and into the kitchen and family room like he was checking on our house. Listen as he retraces his steps, walks back up the stairs, turns off the light, walks back into the bedroom and closes the door shut. I took off the next day and went to stay at my mom's for like two days. I finally told my grandma what happened when I came back home. Growing up, everyone in my family would always joke around about the mysterious man who lived in my grandparents' house. I was convinced he lived in the attic in that same exact bedroom. I never witnessed anything like this ever in this house. I lived there for half my life. The mystery man would move stuff, hide stuff, steal food. This went on for decades. Well, years later, I moved back in for a while with my small child. I've always been a night owl, so I'm the last to go to sleep. I would be sitting in the family room watching TV and I would see someone walking through the dining room. I thought it was my grandma and would expect her to walk right through the kitchen, but nobody came in. I would see this out of the corner of my eye a couple times per week. I moved into another place that I'm also quite convinced is haunted as well. I can't escape it. Bonus file, written by Lucifer's First Lady. I met my grandmother's ghost in a red trench coat. Growing up, I have always had very unexplainable things happen to me, or have seen very paranormal things. Once at about 13 years old, a woman with a red long trench coat and a purple bowler hat with a freshly picked flower in it who had beautiful grey curly hair appeared in front of me. As I was sitting on my bed, the woman smiled at me and said, you look just like her, don't you? Will you tell your mother I love her with all my heart and to not be sad she wasn't there to say goodbye? Me being absolutely dumbfounded, I closed my eyes and opened them again to make sure I wasn't dreaming. When I opened my eyes, the woman was gone. I got up out of bed and ran to the family kitchen where my mom was making dinner for everyone. In tears, I cried to my mom with hysteria describing the strange woman that I had seen. I will never forget her face dropping and the tears welding up in her eyes as she told me that it was her mother who just visited me. My mom never got to say goodbye to her before passing away from lung cancer or got to attend her funeral, who had never met as she died when I was a very young child. 
My mom then proceeded to tell me that she sees her in the same form from a distance waving to her. Then when she blinks or takes a double take, she's gone. My mother then proceeds to sit down and tell me that my family's history, that all the women in my family have had all type of psychic ability that all seem to start from a young age. She always made me feel very believed and heard when I would tell her about things I would see or insights from the universe I would receive. As I have gotten older, I have realized I have many gifts of clairaudience, clairsentience, clairvoyance, claircognizance, and etc. Now, as an adult and only trusting a few people with my gifts, when people ask me how I do it, I say, you know just as much as I do, because I don't know how it happens. It's like asking me how do I breathe, why well, I just do it. My mom always tells me that the universe picks certain souls to carry these gifts and to use them wisely and only tell those people we trust. I'm not schizophrenic for any of those who don't believe in this type of phenomena. I have met people with true mental health issues such as schizophrenia. My gifts are nothing like that. Thankfully, I have an amazing husband who is always happy to listen to what I experience and who finds lots of interest in my relationship with the universe. So thankfully, I have a beautiful support system to keep me grounded. Case file number 1384, written by Hartagon. Me and my dad saw a flying car. When I was like 8 or 9, my dad was driving me to a doctor's appointment. It was like 8 in the morning and on a highway, so still a bit of traffic from people on their morning commutes to work downtown. Traffic wasn't exactly bumper to bumper and at a crawl, but it was still rather packed and about half the speed limit or less. As we were going along, I glanced over at the rear view mirror. It was in a truck with those extra wide mirrors with multiple angles, so I could see behind us despite being in the passenger seat. About three or four cars back, I saw a car literally leave the ground and do a front flip, landing upside down. My dad was a firefighter, so he pulled over to see if he could help in some way. He couldn't. But neither of us saw what caused the accident, and I still have no idea. It wasn't the guy speeding into the back of the car or front of him or the car behind him speeding into him. There simply wasn't enough room for anyone to be speeding. Plus, neither the car in front of him or behind him were involved in the accident as far as I can tell. No one else stopped, traffic in front of him kept going, and traffic behind him went around and kept going. I don't see how he could have hit someone or have been hit hard enough to do a literal front flip and not have the accident heavily damage the other car as well. The driver of the car was pretty banged up and unconscious, so it's not like my dad could inquire as to what happened. He couldn't even help at all really, since it wouldn't be safe to move him. We were there and my dad just basically kept an eye on him until the fire department and police arrived. No idea if my dad ever got any updates on what happened or how the driver turned out. And if he did, he never told me. But even now, I can't think of any way for that accident to have occurred in the way it occurred. Case file number 1385, written by Space and Time 12. The Aliens of Fire. So this happened a few years ago. It was probably like 2015, 2016. I don't usually share what I saw because I know people will just dismiss me. I've told a few people but there weren't any other witnesses and I didn't have a camera capable of taking a picture in the dark. I had a basic phone with a slide out keyboard. Anyway, it was approximately between 2200 and 0 hundred hours. And I was at the little dirt parking lot for a nature preserve that's only about a mile or so away from where I live. So I go down there to smoke and I'm sitting on the tailgate of my pickup truck loading up. Important note, I was not intoxicated when I witnessed this. When I saw a flying object I was not able to identify. There were some fluffy clouds and this object can be best described as a campfire in the sky. It was orange, yellow and red and continuously moving in the way a fire moves when burning. That fire emoji is pretty close to what its general shape was. So this object descended through the clouds and I could see it illuminate the cloud as it passed through. It moved very slowly and stopped on a dime after it came through the bottom of the cloud. At this point, it's kind of just hovering in one spot below the clouds. I tried to take a picture but my camera couldn't detect its light as it was too far away. But I got very excited and I was thinking, holy crap, this is my chance to make contact with the aliens. I need to try to signal it and try to get it to come closer. Maybe these aliens will be down to smoke with me. The object seemed aware that I was watching it. 
because it just hung in the sky not really moving. After assessing the situation, my best option to signal to it was to hold my phone up facing the object and press a button to activate the screen, so that's what I did, and the light came on my phone. And as soon as I did, the object flew away faster than anything humans have, and in a direction that human aircraft cannot fly, it moved in a J shape, up through the clouds. I'm assuming back into space. It was instant acceleration. Nothing that humans have can move like that. People inside would be crushed by 100 Gs of force. I have encountered a few other people in my area that have seen a similar object that they can only describe as like a campfire in the sky, with movement capabilities unlike anything on Earth. Bonus file written by Anonymous, Casino Rama's Dark Secret. Long story short, in late summer 2008, I was in the bushes outside the back doors to Casino Rama lying on the ground well concealed within the bushes, waiting to die. I had taken one last flyer on gambling and lost everything, then thrown away my wallet and stretched out on the ground there in the bush. I ended up lying there for five hours before I got hauled off to the hospital. At some point during those five hours, some kind of rodent crossed my leg. It was walking strangely, jerkily, very tense in its movements and staring around like it was terrified but it treated my body like part of the ground and didn't seem to be aware that it was walking over top of another living being. I've never seen this type of rodent before or since and I don't know what species it is. Given that the casino is on native reservation land, could have been some curious native spirit having a look-see at this suicidal maniac lying in its bushes? I've never been back but I've thought about passing through that reservation just to see if the local spirits show any sign of recognizing me. Case file number 1386 written by Secret Combs 865. The strange temporal episode on the San Mateo Bridge. About 10 years back, while I was living in San Francisco, me and my roommate drove to Hayward to go watch a movie with a friend of ours who lived in Hayward. To get to Hayward from San Francisco, you have to cross the San Mateo Bridge. I have driven that bridge what feels like a million times, so I am super familiar with how long it takes to get across it. It was a later movie and we didn't get out till a few minutes before midnight. We said our goodbyes and started driving back home to the city. We're on the San Mateo Bridge and my roommate was driving. It was late and I was just enjoying the radio while we drove, super content and relaxed. I then suddenly had this deep feeling that we've been driving for a very long time too long, like it felt like we'd been driving for hours. There weren't very many cars on the bridge at that hour either, and I surveyed my surroundings. The bridge just stretched on before us. Suddenly, my roommate spoke up and asked me if I felt like we'd been driving for way too long on the bridge and my stomach sank. We turned off the radio and I swear to you, the clock said 1.20 am? We had somehow been driving on that bridge for over an hour. We freaked out and became hyper vigilant. I told my roommate who was driving to just stay calm and that I'm sure we'd be off the bridge soon. And sure enough, the hill on the bridge came up that you drove over to get off the bridge and into the Foster City. We sped home to our town home at like 90 miles per hour after we'd gotten off the bridge. That bridge does not take over an hour to cross. I truly feel like we'd gotten stuck in some time loop on that bridge crossing the bay and when we finally realized what was happening, we snapped out of it. And no, we did not drink any alcohol or take any drugs. Has this happened to anyone else? Maybe even on the same bridge? Case file number 1387. Written by Sup, Mr. AJ. When a mysterious photographer interrupts the drive. I was traveling from Cambridge towards Boston, towards R93, driving on Soldier's Field, I believe. I was in a passenger in the car sitting shotgun, as my husband drove. It was a beautiful summer day, windows down, enjoying the ride. We were on a section of road where we had two lanes going in the same direction. There was a black SUV in front of us, which started to travel under the speed limit. I was hoping my husband would pass them, but he's often more patient than I am. Up ahead of us, there is a stoplight. The black SUV slows down even more before coming to a complete stop quite a ways before reaching the stoplight, which is still displaying a green light. My husband stops behind them. A middle-aged Asian woman gets out of the back of the SUV 
from behind the driver and slowly walks around to my side of the car. She is extremely well dressed and has large dark sunglasses on. She comes up to me, having my window down, and is wearing a camera around her neck. She takes her camera and a step back and takes a photo or two of me. She then walks back to her car, never saying a single word. I had internally become petrified for some reason when she picked up the camera and took a picture. My husband did nothing. The SUV remained sitting. My husband finally drove around the car and passed it. The light was still green. We were in a stupefied shock. I did not comprehend why my husband didn't drive off and instead just sat there, allowing her to do this. There was nothing special about our car or us or me. It was such a baffling, odd occurrence. We never really tell people because we have no explanation and it sounds weird and kind of anticlimactic. Case file number 1388, written by 2 Roads 427 The Synchronized Family Dinner Glitch My family just experienced the glitch all together at dinner this evening. We were eating salmon, potatoes, and a bunch of other veggies. Rule is, finish what is on your plate before you ask for more. Dad reminded the youngest who was asking for more salmon. She still has yellow zucchini and potatoes left. Youngest child had been resisting veggies lately. She didn't want the yellow zucchini, so I traded her for some broccolini. She was very happy and ate it all. Then proceeded to finish her potatoes. I saw very clearly that her plate was empty, so I gave her more salmon, took the initial bones out, and dad checked the rest for any other bones. All of a sudden, I see more potatoes and yellow zuck on her plate. I thought maybe dad put some on? Strange because I knew she was getting full already and thought the salmon would be her last serving. Well, I was wrong, and she asked again for more salmon after finishing that second serving. Dad told her again she needs to finish what is on her plate. I suggested that since this was her second serving of potatoes and zook, she did not need to finish that, especially because she did not serve it to herself. Dad then said that it was the original potatoes and zook from the first serving. He recalled that when I gave her the second salmon, those were still on her plate. We had a whole discussion about it and agreed we must have been in different dimensions. Youngest doesn't recall how those got on her plate, but she does know she cleared her plate the first time. The oldest recalled seeing the plate empty too, then said it must have been one of her new ghost friends who gives people things they don't want or need. I don't know how to explain what happened, but I do know it gets annoying because we can't agree and get frustrated since we are seeing things differently. We have been seeing an increase in glitches lately too. File number 1389, written by There Be Sheila's. Why does my dad sit alone in his car every night? I moved out of home not long after graduating high school, but while I was still living with my parents, I'd often witness my dad leaving the house to sit in his car for an hour or so, only to come back inside and continue on like normal. It would only happen at night and it never seemed strange as my dad's always been a car guy and I just summed it up to a man loving his car. Recently, after visiting for dinner, I asked my mom if she knew why my dad did this and she had no idea what I was talking about. They've been married for 10 years, so it seems strange she'd never picked up on it, but my sister hadn't known about it either. He never drove anywhere when he did this, he just sat there. I didn't want to question my dad about it. For whatever reason, the idea made me uneasy. My father and I have a very close relationship outside of this mystery, but it's always made me feel rather strange thinking about it. Case file number 1390, written by Malatov, The Intruder's Riddle. Myself and some co-workers got transferred to another facility for a long-term contract, two years. The new facility was about eight hours away, so instead of staying in a hotel, four of us rented an apartment. One night, I was there by myself and got up to go to the bathroom. I hear someone in the kitchen and look down the hallway to see a backpack on the couch. I figured it was one of my coworkers getting off early and used the bathroom and went back to bed. A couple days later, I saw my coworkers and asked them about it. They denied it and said they were on an overnight job about three hours away. Then I remembered the deadbolt on the door was still locked the next morning. It only unlocked from the inside. The only way in or out of the apartment was the front door, 
or a crawl space that had the door nailed shut. The scariest part was not knowing how someone got in or out. I've dealt with home intruders before, so it's nothing new for me. It just freaked me out that someone could come and go as they please. Case file number 1391, written by Biomaster09. The Sinister Swings. Back when I was in college, I, a 250 pound guy, fairly muscly, was at my friend's house and she lived about two blocks from an elementary school with a really nice park and playground attached. Outside of school hours, no one went there, so we used to go there all the time and just hang out, day, night, crack of dawn, whenever. It was always fun to just get away. One night, around midnight, we had just eaten at IHOP and decided to hang out on the swings. For some reason, it seemed darker than normal that night and just weird. We were sitting on the swings and not talking much. All of a sudden, I had this insane feeling of fear and just wrongness come over me. I don't know how to explain it, but the entire park just felt wrong. Like my mind and body just started screaming at me to get the hell away from the park right at that exact instant or else. About that time, she turned to me and said, You, uh, you want to get out of here? I said yes and we started walking towards the car. We made it maybe 5 feet and we both, at the exact same time, started running as fast as we could to the car, jumped in and drove off as fast as we could. Turned out she had that exact same pervasive feeling of just wrongness about the place. To this day, I have no idea why we both felt that sudden intense fear and uneasiness about a place we had been to hundreds of times. To this day, neither one of us has gone back to that park. Case file number 1392, written by Mother Bike, from the dance floor to the crash site. I was taking dance lessons about 20 minutes away from my house and was getting a ride home from my mom one night after lessons. We stopped at a red light and I happened to notice a car coming up to the T-shaped intersection rather erratically. They had the green and I said to my mom, they better slow down. No sooner than the phrase left my mouth, crash. The car had just missed the transformer, but hit the streetlight next to it. I jumped out of the car, as did five kids in a car that was right next to the light the first car had hit. Me and five guys are trying to get the guy to come out too, but then me and another one of the guys sees the passenger coming to speak frantically in some Russian or European language. The two of us go over to her side of the car, ask her if she's okay, and in some broken English, she says she is. However, she's also getting herself out of the car. We try to get her to stay put, but now the guy is coming too. We check on him while my mom is on the phone with the police in the background. The woman starts heading off down towards a gravel road further away from the crash site. A few of us follow her to make sure she's okay. She probably had a concussion at least. There's some townhouse style apartments nearby, and we follow to what is presumably her house. All of us are just confused as a little voice calls to her after she knocks on the door. In her native language, I assume, she told the child to open the door. She then looked at us standing about 5 feet away with what we can now see in the faint porch light is a broken left arm and said, Please go, I'm fine. The child lets the mom in and we head back to see the guy getting loaded onto a stretcher, but I heard he was a bit combative before we got back. I still to this day have no idea what all that was about, but I have a strange feeling she went home to hide something that she shouldn't have had in the car with her. Hope she's okay. Case file number 1393, written by Mobis1985, the night aliens invaded our Hawaiian retreat. In 2009, I went to a destination wedding in Hawaii. For the purpose of the story ahead, I was sober for 6 months at this time. I never did any hallucinogens. We stayed on Oahu on the North Shore, actually very close to the Banzai Pipeline and we had this really cool home rented that was a small airplane hangar converted into a house with all the amenities. We had an unobstructed view of the Hawaiian waters from the porch. On the first night, my dad, his girlfriend and I watched the different colors of the sky as day turned into dusk. We hung out and had some food. They had a couple beers and I had my sodas. While it was still light out, I decided I was tired from traveling and went in to watch some TV. 
Not longer than five minutes pass and my dad and his girlfriend call for me to come back out to the rear porch. I walk out of the sliding glass door and see them standing and pointing towards the ocean. There was a small fishing boat out in the water, close enough to see what it was, but far enough to not really tell how big it was. It was still somewhat light out and the sun had not completely gone down. I don't really remember what time it was. As I looked towards the boat, what I saw, what we all saw, was what looked like a red flare holding steady in the sky. It was about as bright and the same color as a red stoplight, but slightly brighter. No pulsing, no movement, just stuck in the sky. It was too far and too still to be a flare, but we figured it was something from the boat. Then all of a sudden, the intensity of the red light grew, and from the light came two more lights in the shape of a triangle. It looked like the other two red lights morphed and rotated out from the first and was now three. Our jaws hit the floor. Again, this was still pretty far out on the coast, but slightly easy enough to see with the naked eye. Luckily enough, there were a pair of binoculars inside that I grabbed as I darted into and back out of the house. As I pulled the binoculars up to my face, the object disappeared right before my eyes. I thought to myself, are you freaking kidding me? Then two seconds later, boom, it reappeared behind a cloud cover to our right, towards the bonsai pipeline. It absolutely lit the cloud up, so much so that it moved into now emitting a pulsing red light. I'm getting chills just thinking about it now. That same red color, as before, bloomed into the cloud and lit up the sky. I have never seen anything move like that in my life. The weirdest part was that there was no sound. Zero. Anything that I know of that moves like that, from one place to another in our atmosphere, breaks the sound barrier, or you can at least hear the engines or propellers. I could hear the sound of the waves from the north shore hitting the beach. Then it did it again. It disappeared again and moved to the cloud in front of us. This time it was more visible. I used the binocular to see what it was and this part will be ingrained in my memory forever. A black, triangle-shaped object with one red glowing light on each corner of the craft. It sounds nuts, but we all saw this thing. What happened next was that it used the cloud cover to move away from us heading out towards the ocean. I handed the binoculars to my dad so he could get a glimpse and when he handed them back to me, I looked through them again to see that miles away, I could still see the black triangle, this time with no red lights, essentially just leaving. But now there were more of them. I counted five of them. And they were, well, just leaving, as in heading up at an angle that I've never seen any craft move at, at a speed that should have generated some sort of sound, especially with five of them now, leaving as if they were departing our atmosphere. And then they were gone. I dropped the binoculars. We were absolutely stunned. This whole encounter took place in less than 90 seconds. I know that there is a military base on the island and wonder if it was some sort of test aircraft. To this day, I still don't know what I saw, what we saw. Sometimes we bring it up to each other, but never really tell anyone else about it. Who would believe it? This is still, by far, the most unexplainable thing that has ever happened to me. Bonus file. Written by Scorch215, The Black Mass That Haunted Our Road. This was back in high school. Live in a rural area where deer and elk are common. Was coming home from a school game night where we got to play video games on the school's TV with a friend who was driving. Was going to spend the night at his place due to it being around 2 a.m. We came around a corner and couldn't see the lines of the road ahead of us as a black mass was blocking it. Yes, we were speeding, so when my friend slammed on his brakes, we hit the mass. There was no feeling of impact. Thinking we hit a deer or elk, we backed up a bit to see. After getting well past where we saw the mass, there was nothing anywhere. We got out with some flashlights and checked the sides of the roads. Nothing. We realized there was no impact or sound at that point and the fact the mass blocked an entire two-lane road with ease was frankly spooky. We booked it back to his truck, got in and nearly peeled out of there, locking every door in his place and basically not separating for several hours in case something else happened. 
is file number 1394, written by Striped Macaroon, the night I defied death on Sunset Boulevard. My heart is already beating fast telling a story. Only those closest to me know that this happened until now. When I was 25 years old, I was driving home from work one night. I lived in Los Angeles at the time. I was driving on Sunset Boulevard, heading west towards my apartment in Brentwood. For those that are not familiar with the area, there is an expanse of sunset near UCLA that is very curvy. It is two lanes on either side with no shoulder. It was 8.30 on a Saturday night, so there was some traffic. I was driving along and all of a sudden, about 50 feet in front of me, I saw a car, but I was looking at the passenger door. A car had spun out of control and was perpendicular in my lane. I didn't have time to stop. I looked to my right and saw there was a car next to me, so I had nowhere to go. I instinctively turned my car all the way to the right anyway. Once I had cleared the first car, I spun it all the way to the left, still trying to avoid the second car. While all of this was happening, I remembered a time with my mom at Disney World when I was three. This is not a memory I have ever had. I vaguely remember parts of that trip, but this memory was not one of them. I realized then that my life was flashing before me, and I was going to die. I had never been so sure of anything. Every part of me knew I was about to die. I started screaming. To this day, I don't know if I vocalized anything or if it was all in my head. I yelled, No, no, this isn't fair, I'm not done yet. All the while, swerving all over Sunset Boulevard. I suddenly stopped my car and I was now perpendicular in the opposing lane of traffic. I looked around and there was not a single car anywhere. It was like everything had been wiped clean. I put my car in reverse and proceeded home. I did not see a single car the rest of the way. I was only 5 minutes away from home at that point, but Sunset Boulevard on a Saturday night was completely empty. I got to my apartment and parked on the street. I didn't see one person. While walking to my apartment, I came to the conclusion that I had died and because I said no. I was stuck in some limbo. I had never wanted my roommate to be home so badly. Unfortunately, she wasn't. I called one of my best friends and said, I need to ask you some questions. Please just answer me and I will explain after. I asked her my name, my age, what city we lived in, and the date. Obviously, she was very alarmed. I explained that I thought I was dead and I wasn't sure I was really on the phone with her. She tried to convince me that I was alive and that everything was okay. But there was no way mathematically to escape it. There was nowhere for the car on the right to go. This moment has haunted me my whole life. There have been times when I have questioned my existence. I've wondered if my life since has been a very detailed death trip and I'm actually lying on Sunset Boulevard bleeding out. After many years of meditation, spiritual practice, and belief in quantum physics, I wonder what life I jumped into. Case file number 1395, written by Anonymous. When Josh defied time and space. We were in year 8, 12 to 13, and messing around in school on our lunch break. My friends and I decided we should play tag. Me, a few others, and Josh, the central point of this story. I am it, and I give them a 5 second head start. Josh ran into our area. Our school had separate areas for years 7 and 8s, mostly so we didn't have any excuse to be late for classes. Our section, year 8s, was on ground level. It only had one entrance and exit point on the inside. This is where things get strange. To get from the year 8 home base, you had to either use the indoor entrance or exit outside and walk maybe 3 minutes outside, up some stairs, and cross a bridge. Josh, the slowest person in our group, managed to get from the indoor entrance to the year 8 home base all the way to the indoor bridge exit of the year 7 within the 5 second countdown. There were no storage closets or stairways between the two. No lift, elevator. Nothing. When I saw him, he genuinely had no clue as to how he'd gotten there so fast. Me at the time, being a stupid 13 year old, didn't pay much attention to this until we all saw each other recently, over 6 years later, and he brought it up. He still swears on his life that he does not know what happened. 
and that it freaked him out for years. Case file number 1396, written by Snowy556, The Cemetery, 15 years later. When I was younger, I would have dreams from time to time when I would visit my favorite uncle, who would be building a castle. Every time I had the dreams, the castle would be more and more built and ended up looking like a large cobblestone building. After he passed away, we went to the cemetery where he was buried, and the main building of the cemetery was the one from my dreams, same layout inside and everything. Now I had never been there before and never had another relative buried in the cemetery. I had to use the bathroom and told my parents. They said they would help me look, but I told them I knew where it was. The bathroom was right where it was in my dream. I haven't had anything like this happen since and this was maybe 15 years ago when I was 9 or 10. Case file number 1397, written by Wrongway34567. I cheated death on an impossible road. It was a normal day. Well, what you could call normal, according to my life standards. I could remember hearing about this road every now and then. Someone would mention it to me when discussing locations of restaurants or stores. They would point to it, a long narrow side street that seemed to go nowhere. You couldn't see through the end of it, so it was kind of spooky in a way. Many times I would ride by it on my way home. I would glance to my right and then keep straight and think one day I'm going to go down that road and see what's down there, but I'd just keep passing it. One day, I headed out to go somewhere and decided to go down the road to see what was there. The street was wide, the pavement bright, not the usual street, and there was grass on both sides. I remember it was a nice little ride, but nothing was there, so I decided to make a U-turn and head out. As I drove out, to my surprise, I saw two vehicles entering from the intersection. I thought they must be lost, there's nothing here. One of them was an El Camino, and the other was a UPS truck. They were on the left side of the road and I was on the right. I remember thinking it's a beautiful day. I was comfortable. I must have been adjusting the radio and when I looked up, the UPS truck quickly pulled into my lane in order to pass the El Camino, but he didn't have time because they ended up side by side and my car was directly in front of his. There was no room for him to pass. It happened so fast, knowing that he had nowhere to go except to the right which didn't even seem like an option. I braced for impact. It was inevitable. I closed my eyes and for some reason the words, I believe, came out of my mouth. I waited, waited, waited. My eyes were closed so there was nothing but darkness. I didn't hear anything, so I opened my eyes. I was still going down the road. I slammed on the brakes and looked through my rearview mirror and the El Camino and UPS truck were both parked on the left side of the road further up the street. I jumped out and said, What happened? To my surprise, they were both yelling the same thing. The UPS guy was running towards me, waving both hands, kind of skipping with excitement. And the El Camino guy got out of his car and were all talking at the same time. I was saying, I thought you... And he was saying, I did. And the other guys were saying, what happened? We were all trying to explain it at the same time, but just gave up after a while and got back in our cars and drove off. It was pretty incredible. It was like when I closed my eyes and said that time adjusted everything. Because really, I was sure we were going to crash. I brushed it off and went on my way, but thinking back to that moment, it was pretty incredible. Case file number 1398, written by Background Again. My lost toy returns after two decades. When I was around four years old, I was playing with a matchbox car over a vent in my house and accidentally dropped it down into the inner air ducts. I was fairly distraught about it, but never convinced my parents to go get it for me. Twenty odd years later, we've moved into a new house. My brother and I were musing about that and rationalized where the car would have ended up. We opened up the air ducts in the basement, I dropped a tennis ball or two down the same vent I recall dropping the car into, and we dislodged it out. From upstairs, I hear my brother in the basement call out that there's something else lodged up in the vent and to drop some more balls through. I dropped a few more and an exact version of the same car comes tumbling out. I asked my parents if they bought me a replacement. They assuredly said no, and I have no recollection of re-losing it down the same vent. 
entire family would have reminded me of that. We were the second owners of the house. The only thing I could reason was that a previous kid was playing with the exact same car and did the exact same thing. But man, does this feel unlikely. Case file number 1399, written by Jas the Brit. Woman and dog vanish. What really happened? To set the scene, I work at a small pet store. We usually only have one or two customers inside at a time. There are two doors into the store, a front and a back door, and they both set off a chime when opened to alert us so we can make sure to welcome every customer. Today, I was about to check out the only customer in the store when I heard the back door chime. As I was making my way up to the register to check out this guy, I caught a glimpse of the second customer as she walked between the aisles. She was a young black woman being led by a small fluffy white dog on a leash. I make a mental note of what she looks like, so that when I'm done checking this guy out, I can go greet her properly, tell her about her deals, and see if she needs any help. I check the guy out, it only takes a minute, and he leaves. The door chimes on his way out, but I haven't heard any other chimes, so I know that the black lady is the only customer now in the store, and I start looking for her. I'm searching through the aisles and I can't find her anywhere until I suddenly stumble across another woman with a dog on a leash, but she's Asian and her dog is much bigger, maybe 50 pounds and brown. I scour the rest of the store three times over and she's the only customer in there. The black lady is nowhere to be seen. I have no idea where the black lady went and how the Asian lady came in. I had a view of both doors when I watched the guy leave out the front door. No one slipped in around while he was leaving. I can't stop thinking about it. It's freaking me out. We don't have cameras so I can't check if I'm going crazy but I know what I saw. Did the black lady disappear? Or shapeshift into an Asian lady? Case file number 1400. Written by King Curly. I prevented the zombie apocalypse with ranch dressing. A few weeks before my brother's birthday in June, I had a dream about us at a restaurant, celebrating with family. In the dream, I got these buffalo chicken waffle fries. The waitress asked if I want the ranch dressing on or in a cup. I ordered the fries and a few moments later, three men stormed through the door and started ravaging people, biting necks and blood everywhere. Dream ends. Fast forward to my brother's birthday. We sat down at a restaurant with the family. I looked at the menu and realized I'm about to order the buffalo chicken waffle fries. Cute déjà vu feeling. I looked at my brother and tell him this is the exact situation, exact place and time as my dream. The waitress gets to me and I order the fries. She asks, ranch on or off? I tell my brother, if I order the ranch on these, I start the zombie apocalypse. I think for a second and order it off in a cup. Afterwards, I look back at him and tell him if I'm right, three guys will walk in but not be zombies. I turn around and crap you not, three men walk in like normal. The pure shock on my brothers and family's faces was uncanny. So yeah, dreams are not coincidences. And also ranch is more powerful than we know. Case file number 1401, written by Anonymous. The fire that revived itself. Had just finished middle school and had a sleepover with a friend. Their parents set up a tent in the yard, maybe 10 feet from the front door, and huge patio windows. And we had a fire. It was in the front of the opening of the tent. They stayed with us for a while before going inside, but they left us a pretty big bucket of water, big enough to sufficiently soak everything in the small pot fire. My friend and I get tired, drench the fire, again, everything soaked entirely, and get in the tent. A couple minutes later, it begins to rain pretty hard lasts about 10 minutes and I'm dozing off. Not entirely gone, but in that semi-conscious way. My friend isn't far behind. And then I hear her say my name in a tone that told me she was alarmed but calm, but this doesn't entirely compute. I asked, what? In a semi-irritated tone, cause I'm trying to sleep here. And she goes, the fire is back on. I stayed laying there for a second before it registered. But my sleepy brain made the calculations pretty quick. We drenched that fire and it rained after. Someone started the fire back up. I'm suddenly wide awake. I bolt up and scramble out of the tent 
immediately circle it in case someone was going to attack us coming out. Start scanning the tree line about 50 feet back. See nothing, but again, it's dark. My friend is frantically looking around too. I can see enough since the porch light was on and the fire that's now roaring like we never put it out. Keep in mind we're like 13. I'm keeping as calm as I can, despite the adrenaline coursing through me and fighting the instinct to run inside. But now, of course, we have to put this fire out again. The big bucket is empty, which proved to me I didn't hallucinate the whole thing and the ground was still wet. So I tell my friend to go inside and fill it up and I'll stay outside and watch. Probably not the best decision at the time, but my thinking was there were too many blind spots if I went back inside. Longest 5 minutes of my life. She comes back out, puts out the fire, and we take turns getting our valuables out of the tent while the other watches, and retreat back into the house. Given the house had a crap ton of windows and sliding glass doors, I didn't sleep well that night. We never saw anyone, and heard nothing after. I don't know if it was an actual person that somehow escaped both of our notice. It wasn't my friend, because I would have felt her get up, heard the zipper, etc. Maybe it was some freak of nature, but I swear up and down that fire was out. Case file number 1402, written by Fantasy Footage. There's a reason my rent is so cheap. When I lived in my old apartment in the Midwest, the rent was unbelievably cheap for the size. Two spacious rooms and a bathroom for less than a thousand dollars a month. Most days life went on as usual, but there was one incident that still baffles me to this day. It was a sunny afternoon, and I decided to tackle the ever-growing pile of dishes in the sink. I reached for the blue dish soap, a familiar container, and as I was about to use it, something inexplicable happened. The bottle vanished into thin air right before my eyes. I couldn't believe it. I stood there, staring at the empty spot on the counter where the blue bottle had just been a moment ago. I checked the immediate surroundings, thinking maybe it had fallen or rolled away, but it was nowhere to be found. Puzzled and somewhat frustrated, I searched the entire apartment, even places where the bottle had no reason to be, but it had seemingly disappeared from existence. Defeated and utterly perplexed, I returned to the kitchen and glanced back at the sink, and there it was, as if nothing had ever happened. The blue dish soap bottle, neatly placed next to the sink. My mind raced with confusion and disbelief. Had I imagined the entire incident? Or had I experienced a brief glitch in the fabric of reality? The strangest part was that it wasn't just the bottle that had vanished. It was as if the memory of it had vanished too leaving me questioning if I had run out of soap or forgotten to buy more, even though I was certain it was supposed to be there all along. It felt like a surreal moment, where the boundaries of reality blurred, leaving me with a lingering sense that perhaps there are aspects of our world that defy logic and reason, hidden just beneath the surface of our everyday lives. Case file number 1403, written by Anonymous. Morrowind Mystery, The Khajiit Intruder. I spent a lot of time playing The Elder Scrolls III, Morrowind on Xbox in my early teen years. I had played it at my friend's house and was always on the lookout for a used copy. The game had been out for a bit on console, to show up at a local EB Games, to give a time frame here. Well one day a copy showed up and can you believe that it was the Platinum Hits Game of the Year edition? I was so goddamn happy y'all. Anywho, I sunk so much time into this game and made many characters. My save files were filled with some of my friends games as well, but there was something odd. One day a new file appeared. Now when I say appeared, I don't mean a character one of my friends made and I didn't see it because they played it for like an hour and never touched it again. I mean my system froze, I restarted the console, and there was a new save file. Again, for added weirdness, I want to stress the following facts. I never ever play as Khajiit. My friends and I are anal about properly capitalizing our characters' names in games. I only had one friend who had spent more than a dozen hours on one character on my console. So that being said, this file was the only one. No autosaves associated with it. No additional save files. Nothing. But it was a Khajiit. The name was in lowercase and only one word which was also odd. And this wasn't some new character. This boy was like lower 20s in level 
had days of time logged on the file and had at least one artifact that I can remember. It was a gold brand, which is why I remember it, and was dressed in essentially expensive robes and street clothes in the middle of nowhere. To this day, I have no idea where it came from. None of my friends ever owned up to it, despite, again, the time factor making it impossible. And I would have gladly booted up the game and taken some pics to share, but that Xbox, despite the fact that I still own it, is a fire hazard. It's one of the ones that suffered from that corroded power prongs on the rear port. You cannot plug it in without smelling ozone. An additional note of techno weirdness. There was one point in time where a buddy and I were playing Halo split screen and blowing each other up and whatnot on Blood Gulch. And I swear to god there was a third player in one of the bases. Just something we'd both see vanish around the corner, but wouldn't be there when we investigated. However, I do acknowledge that one is pretty easy to explain, as a trick of the eye and us feeding into each other at the moment. <laughs> Case file number 1404, written by Prank Surrett. The Time Bending Hellos. I just got back from seeing my mom not that long ago, and I was reminded of something that has always happened to me. I moved into my mom's house when I was 13. She's always had animals, usually two or three cats and a dog. She's also always worked jobs where she had the closing shift more often than not. So when she came home from work, she'd always say to the animals, and myself when I moved in with her, Hey guys, I'm home. Now, I'm a night owl, so I'd always stay up late enough to at least greet her when she got home and talk to her for a bit. More than once, I've been up on the computer or in my room and heard the door unlock. My mother walk in and say, Hey guys, I'm home. And I'd respond with a, Hi lady, and then get up to go see her only to see that she wasn't home yet. However, anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour later, she'd be home, so I always heard her come home before she actually arrived. After I moved in with my boyfriend, whenever he and his brother, and later on just him, would leave the house and I didn't go with, I'd always hear them coming up the stairs and into the house about 15 minutes to an hour before they actually arrived. One time, I even heard him coming up the stairs and called out a greeting to him, when he didn't reply, I figured he was in the bathroom and would be out in a moment. Only I got a text from him right after that telling me he'd be home in about 20 minutes. Case file number 1405, written by just a bit, 5150. A bizarre incident of psychic retrieval. When I was in my early 20s, I dated a guy that became more and more abusive. We got in a fight, but that's another story. And he yanked my rings off my fingers. I used to wear several, some quite valuable. He took them and left. The next day I drove to his house to get them back. I pulled up and I guess he saw me because he stepped into the garage and the garage door was open. Typical messy garage, shelves, tools, needed a good cleaning. I walked in, straight up to a cluttered shelf, pushed some tools out of the way, and picked up my ring sitting on the back of the shelf. His jaw dropped and he asked how the hell I knew where he hid them. I really have no idea, could have been anywhere, but I just knew they were there. I had no doubts, kind of like I was being led right to where they were. I got my rings and left. Case file number 1406, written by Warrior Kalis, the Rainfall Wizard. This was many years ago. Me and my best friend, now my brother-in-law, had walked to the mall along the train tracks one summer day, a good, just guessing here, 10 miles away on a straight line. Going there was not bad, it was cool enough in the morning that it was comfortable. We spent some time at the mall and tried to call for a ride with the payphone but could not get through to either of our parents, so we decided to walk home. By the time we started walking home, it had gotten much hotter and as a heavy set teenager, I was struggling. Well. As we passed by a home that was having a pool party in the back, we heard a weather report of a severe storm coming. Not five minutes later, the sky opened up and the rain came crashing down. Now, the rain itself was a godsend and I was feeling much better as we continued down the tracks back home. It was about 10 minutes after the rain started before it happened. In a 10 foot radius around us, it just stopped raining. Both me and him stopped, and the circle just stayed on us. When we started up again, it moved with us. We actually started walking back towards the mall and it moved back with us. 
We walked for a good 15 minutes with no rain falling on us before the circle disappeared and we were once again soaked. I have no idea how to explain that. Bonus file written by a dragon's mom, our cat's strange behavior in the dead of night. When I was fairly young, maybe 8 or 10, I was hanging out at my grandma's house. My mom was in the living room, falling asleep on the couch, bundled up with all the dogs. She was talking to me, trailed off, and promptly fell asleep. Now the staircase is right behind the couch, and is open to the living room before it meets a small platform at the top which has four doors, two bedrooms, a bathroom, and a closet. No one had been up there recently. My mom falls asleep, and for a few seconds I start to respond to her. Then I realize she crashed out, so did the dogs. Then I heard scratching from the upstairs right hand bedroom. I got a really dreadful feeling, but figured that mom earlier must have gone to get something out of there and accidentally locked one of the dogs in there. So I look at the couch where they all are and one, two, three, four, no, all the dogs are laying with her. Even weirder, they're not up in arms about this very loud scratching. These dogs will bark if the wind blows, but they were sound asleep still, even with this continuous scratching. The dread I was feeling got worse, but I crept up the stairs, and when I got about halfway up, the scratching stopped. I froze for a few moments, and it started again. I went the rest of the way up, onto the little landing, and confirmed that it was coming from one particular room, the one on the right. I had thought at first that it might be a mouse because they can be extremely loud when they think that no one is around, but sitting there, waiting to open the door, I could hear where the scratching was on the door. It was like a quarter of the way up and it was heavy scratching, as if a coon was trapped in there or something. I built up my nerves and flung the door open, only to see nothing there. I flipped the frick out. I don't know why, but as soon as I opened the door, I was screaming and crying. My mom woke up and met me halfway on the stairs that I was fumbling down. To this day, we hear scratching and knocking that house at ungodly hours of the night. My grandma passed away and an elderly family friend has been staying in that house. He went and bought cameras because he would hear people in the kitchen at night and the lights would be left on even when he was absolutely certain he had turned them off. He's old but his mind is still sharp. I trust him in that. He also has a cat now. And now, years later, the cat wants into that upstairs room. He doesn't care about the others, but if that door opens, he's in that room before you can even see him dart up the stairs and under your feet. And he goes nuts in there. His eyes dilate. He belly crawls around. He lays on his back and claws at the undersides of the bed. He literally spazzes out and will race around the room in circles. The only other place he does that is the basement, and what do you know? The other night, my mom and I were coming up through the field from the pond where we had been hanging out with friends, and that room light and all the basement lights are on. No one had been down there or up in that room for upwards of a week. The family friend doesn't do stairs well. No one else has been down there and it's all locked from the inside. The last person in that upstairs room was me. I was there about a month ago using his Wi-Fi. I'm very meticulous about turning off lights and I'm certain I did when I left because I remember trying to keep the cat out and fumbling for the switch at the same time before getting the lights turned off. I don't know what's with those rooms or that house. The house isn't even old. My grandparents almost finished building it right before my grandpa died of a heart attack in 01. My mom said she spread some of his ashes in the walls, ones that weren't 100% finished before he died and still needed to be drywalled. I wonder if he was there or if something else was. Case file number 1407, written by Big Seth, The Drive Beyond Time and Space. I was driving home from Omaha last October. While I was in Phoenix on one of my night drives back, I was barreling down the empty freeway and I see hazards up in front of me, so I decide to slow down and get over, and the car behind me would not slow down. I looked at my dash and the numbers and letters got all funky and looked like a completely different language, then immediately changed back. I looked back at the road, 
and the car with the hazards swerved out of the lane it was in like it was in motion. Next thing I know, I'm barreling at a car with no lights or hazards in the middle of the night. I knew I felt my steering wheel jerk hard right, and then hard left just enough to get me in the next lane, and then straighten me out. I have this weird passive belief in the quantum death theory, so I believe that iteration of me did die that night, but I moved on to the next version of me that didn't make that mistake, and I was viewing the same action over and over, and the dash acting funny was all those versions of reality overlapping for a split second. Or it was my dead grandma, who had road rage, watching out for me. Case file number 1408, written by Bonita248, The McDonald's Mandela Mystery I know people that have seemingly died and squished over to a parallel universe. They remember their death or remember being in a situation where they could have died, but yet lived and noticed things a bit different than before. However, I did not die from my recollection nor did I come close to death, but I feel like something strange is definitely going on and I have no clue as to what. To begin, I am a long-term worker at McDonald's. I work full-time and all the time. Anyways, in the beginning of summer, we started to sell a frappe flavored beverage called Cookies and Cream. Now before we actually start to sell something new, our restaurant gets flyers and pocket keepers explaining the new product. So I studied the pocket keeper and it definitely said cookies and cream frappe. The drink was made with small Oreo pieces, so I thought to myself, why don't they just call it an Oreo frappe? I can remember when it was finally time to sell it. Now they put the button in order for us to ring this new drink up and the button also said cookies and cream being the flavor. So when customers would order it and say Oreo frappe, I would be petty and say, you mean cookie and cream? After a while, everyone was saying Oreo frappe, so I started saying it also. However, now the drink is discontinued, and here's the strange part. The other day, I was thinking of the drink and said to someone, I remember when that cookie and cream frappe came out, and everyone was calling it an Oreo frappe. I laughed a little, and the person I was talking to said it was an Oreo frappe. So I go on into my little speech about how I knew it was made out of Oreos, but was called a cookie and cream frappe. However, no one remembers this. I even went to prove it on the register because even though we don't sell it anymore, it will still have the flavor but blanked out. To my surprise, when I looked, the button now says Oreo? What the freak? I don't know when it changed or how it changed, but I know it did not always say that. However, no one remembers the original name, and I cannot even prove it because all the flyers and pocket keepers are nowhere to be found. Such a simple and non-important glitch, but I definitely know that something isn't right. Bonus file, written by Fabrice 1989 The day the cemetery held us captive. When I was in Ecuador, I was about 8 years old when we went to the cemetery to visit my aunt, who recently passed away. This must have been around two weeks after she was buried. It was my uncle, my mother, my grandma, my cousin and I. This cemetery was huge, and it had sections for the people buried in the ground close to the entrance, but the ones buried in the walls were way deep inside. A good 10 minutes walking to reach the first building, since the cars were not allowed inside. There was only one way in. The front gate had two security guards. Anyways. When we finally reached the building, we saw an old woman leave the building. She was hunched over, walked really slow, and didn't acknowledge my mom and uncle when they said hello and excuse me. We didn't think much of it, she was probably mourning and upset so we left it alone. We went to the third floor where my aunt was, we prayed and cried etc. Then we decided to leave. My grandma said she couldn't stop shaking, that she felt like she was freezing. Now keep in mind this was around June in Ecuador. It was hot, even if you wore shorts and a tank top. We were burning and sweating in there, while my grandma was freezing. When we finally got downstairs, we noticed that the door was locked, and had a chain with a combination lock. My uncle and mom tried to scream for help so somebody would come and unlock it. Their immediate thought was that the cemetery was closing and they didn't realize we were still inside but we never saw anybody on our way besides that woman. 
The adults didn't have cell phones because they don't think they were around, or if they were, they probably weren't that common or too expensive. So calling for help was not an option. My uncle tried hitting the railings and windows to make as much noise as possible, but there was no way the guards all the way to the front would hear us. Like I mentioned above, it was a good 10 minute walk to our location. We were there for a good hour. My cousin and I are obviously scared and crying. It's getting dark and the heat is just too much. Then my grandma just gets up and walks away. My mother and uncle check up on her, but she ignores us. We follow her to the door. She grabs the chain and combination lock, stares at it for a few seconds, and then she unlocks it. At this point, my mother and uncle are in complete shock. My grandma still refuses to speak or acknowledge us. My cousin and I are laughing and trying to make fun of each other for crying, pretending we weren't walking around in pea-covered pants. So we walked all the way to the front gate and informed the guards that we were trapped inside and somebody locked us in. The guards assured us that we were the only people inside and that nobody else had left. They followed us to the building, but the chain and combination lock were gone. That's what I remember. Until I brought it up to my mother when I was older and I questioned her about it. Because I wasn't sure if it was a stupid memory my little brain made up and I was believing it to be true all these years, but she confirmed it was real. She also mentioned that my grandma was questioned about the event, but she said she didn't remember any of it. Apparently, this was what was discussed between my grandma, mom, and uncle. My grandma had no memory of anything that happened after we finished praying and crying at my aunt's coffin. She also doesn't remember opening the lock chain and helping us escape. It's totally blank. Case not to file 1365. Dragonfly 813. It's kind of hard to conceive of a more interesting method to say hello to loved ones than this, because it's subtle at first, but then there's a wave of realization that just crashes into you when you consider how many spiritual things your grandfather would have had to pull in order to accomplish this, in order to orient your sister and yourself into precisely these rooms and that bunk for you with the little pin of the dragonfly. Wow, I'm very impressed, honestly. This is just a cool story of a grandfather who wanted to be known again. Case not so far, 1366. Ghosts of relationships past, present, and future. So first I want to add a little note regarding breakups. It's true in one sense of the coin that you're causing heartache and pain to someone you presumably love or at least liked a lot. But if you're being honest with yourself and don't see yourself happy with them long term, it's a form of kindness. If you're not happy, there's no way they would be either in the deep of the future. In a nutshell, you're not a bad person for breaking up with them, if the reasoning was along those lines. That said, breaking up with someone is never an easy thing to do, and if you do it wrong, well, you can cause more pain than necessary. But no one's perfect, so don't beat yourself up too much if you fumble the ball. Now seeing into the future isn't the real mystery here. It does happen quite a lot, or soul projecting to witness current events happening now in the present. But the missing time, Confirmed via security camera footage? That's just wild. I think this may have been your guardian angel interfering more directly than they usually do, just to show you that she's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. She's going to go on and build herself a good life, and it's okay that you broke up. You don't have to concern yourself with that. If the future didn't come to pass, then I would say, oh, it's your, just your mind, your subconscious trying to ease you, yourself. And at the time this happened to you, maybe that's what I would have said, but Given that, indeed, this did predict the future, what actually would happen to her, it's pretty clear what happened. Some, some force, maybe a guardian angel, makes the most sense to me, wanted you to feel at ease. Mission accomplished, I hope. <laughs> okay, so for the bonus file, The Whispering Pines. As humans, we have a very sharp sense to unusual presences. Animals do too. But I think our ability to sense danger is at times even more pronounced, at least we can sense danger from virtually no input at all, when there's effectively nothing to go on whatsoever. People often underestimate their ability to know when danger lurks around each corner, or in this case, behind a pine tree. <laughs> it's a real and potent kind of spidey sense, without any comic mutations required. Embrace this power. Could save your life one day, seriously. And I have no idea what was actually out there. Was it just a human being trying to break in but realize people were there when you screamed? Or was it some supernatural entity? I guess you'll never know. And that's a good thing. And now time for the quote of the day. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But raptors are pretty scary too. Devin J. Monroe, 
Ah, uh, yes, the raptors. <laughs> you know, first time I watched Jurassic Park, I think I was like 10 or something like that. My dad showed it to me. My dad would show me a lot of movies that maybe weren't <laughs> ideal for my age range, but all, all, I'm okay with that <laughs> at this point. Um, but I was pretty terrified. There's nothing, I mean, the, a giant T-Rex is menacing, and we have a whole mythos about that with an exaggerated version in Godzilla, just destroying buildings and everything. Not what you want to wake up to, let's just say. But yes, only fear fear itself unless there's a raptor chasing you. Then you can fear the raptor too. 100%. <laughs> Case note so far, 1367. My friend vanished into thin air right in my living room. So a doppelganger encounter, which perhaps is multiverse related. You simply saw a version of your friend that was from a different universe. Funny how I can seriously use the adverb simply to accurately describe this, but there you go. If it quacks like a duck and so on. The really trippy part is her being ported back over to her real universe, switching back and forth, into your living room over there. So, over there in the other universe, where this first one was from, she was uninvited by your perspective because she just popped into the living room over there. But to her, you had invited her. So I bet they both freaked out more over in that universe <laughs> where she just popped into your living room. I bet you freaked out a lot too. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> I guess it could be a pleasant surprise, but you'd figure, like, did you break in? This is a bit uh, forward. Case on so far, 1368. My kid's backpack disappears in broad daylight. So wait, trick-or-treating in an office building? How cool is that? I've never seen an office building do that, but nice. This glitch is actually a little stumping. It's not just a DOP and then a return, because objects almost always come back in the general vicinity of where they disappear. There are a few rare exceptions where there's sentimental value in an object like a necklace or a ring that just mysteriously ported back into like the living room or bathroom of whoever lost it, even though if they lost it at sea or in a different state or whatever. But usually those are after months or years and they have a great value to the person. Like a backpack is pretty ordinary, even with a phone in it, and it re-emerging almost instantly the same day. Feels like some conscious entity would have to be involved in this. A guardian angel is always a good bet, but it doesn't fit neatly like most glitches do, so I'm just not sure on this one. Case on to file 1369, The Vanishing House on Portobello Street. Cinnamon Toast Frick, I will be borrowing this colorful expression. If this was a case of multiverse shenanigans, then there are some problems with that theory. The house wasn't there a couple of times, then it was. So let's say you were driving along in a neighboring universe, then brought back to the original. The other universe was notably different, with the whole house missing. I guess it's plausible, but it's pretty rare for an adjacent universe to have something that large different about them. But if that's the case, how come you were not picked up on the ring camera? Because when you went into the house, it was in the original universe, you already were back. Unless, remember the story involving the couple that suffered extra glitches for a few days after their multiverse event? They were looking for the AC remote, he went outside, but the girl said that he remained inside. They weren't in the same timeline or the same universe. But then they came back, everything was normal, but they had extra glitches happen to them over the course of a few days. So maybe you were ported over to a different universe, came back, reloaded into the original universe, but you literally were not fully rendered in. Your code wasn't 100%. So whatever mechanism is used to detect you on a ring camera didn't trigger for that reason until 30 minutes later when you left. It's kind of unsettling though, because I think multiverse transitions happen pretty often. So if there's errors that can happen in the process where you're simply not coming back all you, at least for a while. And now time for the quote of the day. The estimated amount of glucose used by an adult human brain each day, expressed in M&Ms, is 250. Harper's Index. So you're saying that I can eat 250 M&Ms every day and my brain's gonna use all of that energy just like that. Not too shabby. Yeah, I guess I have to eat some vegetables too. I'll get on that. Hey, you know, nothing wrong with steamed broccoli. With a bit of oil or butter and salt and pepper. Mmm, that is so good. You can stir fry it a bit after, get some color, or just stick it under a broiler. Make sure it's a bit charred. That is next level. Okay, so notes file, 1370. The startling night John Cleese broke the fourth wall. So my guess is the commercial was produced, as you suggest, with him breaking the fourth wall deliberately, but it was never meant to air. What you saw was an accident. Or maybe it was just a gag reel, like 
it wasn't meant to air. This is just uh, some joke that John Cleese did for the crew in the filming of the commercial. But maybe somehow it was accidentally aired as the real thing. I don't know, because you'd need to edit it and everything, so I don't know, maybe not. It is conceivable that it is from a different universe, though. So it was meant to air, but in that universe where the commercial agency had a better sense of humor, I guess? <laughs> because this does sound pretty funny. I wish I could see it too. Case notes of file 1371. The Range Rover that drove out of existence. I can envision a lot of car accidents are actually caused by this kind of multiverse shimmer, let's call it. Seeing things that are there somewhere else, but not truly here. Causing overreactions and other driving errors. But that only you saw it. Hmm. It's more than just the space-time portal then, as previously thought, that can cause these multiverse sighting events. Maybe only some minds can interface with these portals, with these anomalies. And others don't perceive it at all. I think that would make more sense, because of the frequency I believe these portals exist in. If everyone could see them, then I think there'd be a lot more accidents going on every single day, caused by them. Quezon Sofa, 1372. My mother's mysterious intuition thwarts danger. Yep, there you have it again, the universal spidey sense. Most have it, few embrace it. Kudos to your mom, Riti. She listened to her spidey power and saved herself and maybe you too. And serious shame on whoever it was that ran the red light like that, especially around a blind corner. I mean, that's someone who has no regard for other human life at all and none for themselves either. Or they're just completely foolish or drunk, that's always a possibility too. Very shameful. Case notes of the bonus file. The do-it-yourself Ouija experiment. I understand burning the board, after absolute confirmation that spirits exist with this test. If you're not in the know like we are, then that'd be indescribable. That said, really, most spirits aren't evil, out to get you. I bet whatever spirit was there was just lonely. There's a kind of sad irony in that, isn't it? I mean, most spirits are just like most humans. We're just lonely, wanting that divine spark of human connection that'll endure. It's not always easy to find, but it is easier to find as a mortal than as a spirit. (laughs) So there's that silver lining. (laughs) Now time for the quote of the day. In the end, you'll know which people really love you. They're the ones who see you for who you are, and no matter what, always find a way to be at your side. Randy K. Milholland. They stick with you through thick and thin, no matter what. And I think this is an important life lesson to learn, is... Who you choose to to be friends with matters almost as much as what you decide to do with your own life, because your friends are going to influence you. They're going to help you. They're going to need help as well. And if you're with someone that is more parasitical, never gives, only takes, they're energy vampires, that's going to be a negative detriment to your life in general. So be sure to surround yourself with good people. And don't feel bad if you simply don't vibe with some person. We choose who we are close to, and that is so critical to our future. Case notes of file, 1373. Wisconsin's Whispering Grove. So it was warm on the inside, but not the outside. Hmm. That sounds like what people who drink a lot of alcohol feel. Which isn't to say you were all drunk, more that it was a false sensation. There wasn't any extra heat, which makes sense, as the snow wasn't melting at all. Something was inducing that sensation from within affecting your minds. Maybe this entity was trying to connect to your minds and that was creating this anomaly of feeling heat. Here's a question to ponder on. If my instincts are accurate in this case, that this was an extraterrestrial alien, perhaps had crashed here a long time ago, trapped and lonely awaiting rescue from his own kind, well, given the vastness of space, that could take a long time. Even with advanced spacecraft, maybe they don't have FTL drives faster than light. So in that case, it would be some sort of a long-term trip that it, where you're in stasis for the majority of it, which is perfectly viable, it just takes a long time. So if that's the case, that could explain a lot of these creepy creatures that are encountered out in the woods, where these aliens, maybe only a handful of them around, dwell. My guess regarding the noises you heard after this event, just coincidence, normal animal mating calls or indeed the screams from animals being violently attacked by some other predator. I guess it's unrelated to this unknown humanoid that you encountered. The only thing I can't really explain, I've never heard before, is the sensation or the visual sight of green layering over your eyes. Never heard of an alien or any entity inducing that kind of thing. Very strange. Now time for the quote of the day. Whatever you do will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. Gandhi. I love this quote. 
I'm big into science fiction and just science itself, like uh, physics and space and everything. But when you ponder the vastness of space, boy, you can quickly feel completely insignificant. But that's the wrong way to think about it. Is there a grand meaning to life, a cosmic scale purpose? I don't know, maybe not. And in that case, if that's true, then yeah, your actions now don't matter at all. In a thousand years, even if you cure cancer, it won't really matter. They'll have cured it then again, twice over. But is that depressing? Should that mean you just give up and do nothing? No. What it means is, this is a kind of game, a simulation, if you will, if it is a simulation, maybe by God, maybe by humans in another dimension, I don't know. But what I can tell you is, all we have is what's in front of us, and what connects us to emotion and reasoning, and that's other people, other human beings. So what we do does matter because it affects other human beings. And you know, this is probably why I have trouble playing single player games, because in reality, you're just playing against a computer. And to me, I can't connect with that. If I want to play something or do anything, and this is weird for a hermit-style introvert to say, but unless there's other people involved, it doesn't matter to me. But when you put another person, even just one, then everything matters. So nothing matters in the cosmic scale, but everything matters on the human scale. Case Notes so of 1374, The Harrowing Tale of the Abyss and the Hand of God. Riptides are extremely dangerous, and often hard to spot until you're already in one. The best thing you can do if you notice you're being dragged away from the shoreline is to swim parallel to the shore, not towards it, but to its side. The riptides are long, and you can't swim against it, the current is too strong. You'll just tire yourself out as you did in this case. But usually, you can run parallel to the force pulling you out, so just run out of it, swim out of it, and they're not usually very wide, so that's the best strategy. You see the shoreline, you're being pulled away, just look 90 degrees to your left and swim that way, and you should be okay. Also, I'm glad you say he was your then-boyfriend, no longer. Someone who laughed at a riptide event is either stupid or just evil. People die all the time from them, so he maybe he just didn't realize how dangerous it was, but in that case, you know, they're far more dangerous than sharks. I think it's possible that your guardian angel tried to infuse you with more energy. Maybe the, just a perception of energy, an adrenaline spike. So you could save yourself, even if it wasn't the proper way in a riptide. I'm glad you're okay. Case Notes of 1375, The Magic Uber Ride So I'm curious about Uber etiquette, because I don't use it much. Heck, I think I've only taken two Ubers in my whole life. But if the address is wrong, by your mistake or some technical error or perhaps a glitch in the matrix, whatever the cause, can't you just physically tell the driver that it's the wrong address? Maybe that's taboo, I don't know. But it's unfortunate you had to pay for a ride home twice. <laughs> At least nothing bad happened, but that still sucks. It does seem as simple, in quotes, that your phone somehow received your home address from the future, where you're going to live in a year from the then glitch. I really can't offer any explanation as to how this can happen, though. Only that it sometimes does. Perhaps it's like asking why the speed limit of the universe is 299,792,458 meters per second in a vacuum. Well, that's the speed of light. That's the speed of causality just in general. <laughs> but there's no reason why it's that, it just is. Can't tell you why, only that it is. Maybe that's enough for now. Okay, so notes for the bonus file. When puppies break the laws of physics. I will say, never underestimate the powers of a small dog. They're fast as lightning. Kung fu fighting. <laughs> da -da 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 -da. But I do agree in this case, how you describe it. There's no way it was a dog. It must have been a spirit nearby just having fun with you. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now time for the quote of the day. It is well that war is so terrible. Otherwise, we would grow too fond of it. Robert E. Lee. While there's a lot of truth to this, but also an unnerving amount of not entirely true. Because some people do really love war. They love the sheer raw will to power of it. And that is extremely dangerous. Of course, who suffers in war? It's all the innocent civilians that have nothing to do with anything. It's very sad, in my view. Yeah, is war sometimes necessary? Perhaps and unfortunately. But then I also ponder a question. There's this word, collateral damage, which means when innocent civilians die, unintentionally, so-called. Well, if someone breaks into your house and then commits some atrocity against you, but then flees into a neighboring house full of innocent people. Can you harm those innocent people to apprehend the person who harmed you? 
I don't think so. And I think most would agree, right? So if you scale it up to hundreds or thousands or millions of people, at what point is it acceptable to harm innocent people, to seek retribution, or even to protect yourself? I don't know the answer to that question. It's not a hundred, it's not a thousand, it's not ten thousand, is it a million? I don't know. Something worth thinking about, though, I think. Case Altifa, 1376. The Spectral Alien of Edinburgh. Very sorry for your loss. It's just terrible, especially the way he went out, ah. I hope he wasn't in too much pain. I find it interesting how our works of Hollywood fiction so often parallel reality, though taken off into violent extremes. Perhaps the predator-type aliens do exist and are here. The government, namely the CIA, is aware of this, and if you don't know, the CIA actually has a program where they write scripts for movies, and if you use a script, then they'll pay you, and they'll even give you access to various, you know, military equipment, or sit, let you film on a navy ship, or something like that. Things that would be otherwise unrestricted and impossible to film unless it was CGI. So that's a very tempting carrot, and of course, this allows them to control a certain narrative. Maybe this is all meant to be plausible deniability for what's really out there, at least closely related, is my guess. Maybe not entirely the same. And now time for the quote of the day. Anything that is in the world, when you're born, is normal and ordinary, and is just a natural part of the way the world works. Anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary, and you can probably get a career in it. Anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. Douglas Adams Well, I'm 33 now, 33 and a half, so not too far from 35. I suppose any invention after 35 I have to curse in my angry old man voice. <laughs> I'll try not to yell at the kids to keep off the lawn. I don't want to be that old guy. Que Sofa, 1377. The night the stars went silent and the forest screamed. At first, my guess was the locals were trying to scare who they thought was the new property owners away, maybe into even selling the land to them at a discount because of the cultists in the area. However, when you add in the sound dampening details, well, now we're talking about real occult practice. It takes a lot of evil energy in an area, a dark cloud if you will, to reduce the volume of everything in the area, even the wind. There's nothing good about that, and as you say, the man you encountered had a children of the corn vibe. Trust the vibes you get about people. Almost always correct. Case Notes of 1378. The journey of a ring from bleacher to pocket. I think we can all agree this was no accident or even a random glitch. It had to be willed. Someone or something wanted you to have your ring back. Guardian angel, maybe. The ring probably had great significance to you. Maybe even bound to a grandparent that is lingering behind and tethered to it? Huh, maybe it was a grandparent. That'd make the most sense to me, actually. Not just in returning it to you, but also ensuring they're not stuck wandering around a bleacher for eons. No, they'd want to be with you. Much more interesting. Now time for the quote of the day. If you want to tell people the truth, make them laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. Oscar Wilde. Yeah, he was pretty good at that, wasn't he? I think the best person I've ever listened to to be able to do this is George Carlin. Basically, his whole act was telling the truth, slightly exaggerated, in a great delivery. And it worked. It really did. Not too many comedians do that, but some do, and man, it's just... I mean, all comedians tell the truth that is exaggerated, but if you're talking about some grander scale truth, political truth, religious truth, whatever it may be, or at least how you believe it, something that makes sense to you, if you deliver it with a spoonful of sugar, it does help the medicine go down. No doubt about that. <laughs> Break the ice with some humor. Never a bad call. Quesant Sofa, 1379. Whispers of the Dawn. Hmm. I think this could be your own subconscious feedback looping. Your own brain trying to wake you up at exactly when it knew you had to be woken up. And it's really something we can actively train ourselves to do. It's really cool. It's a circadian rhythm alarm. Basically, you think very hard about a specific time just before going to bed. This forces that memory to be cataloged by your subconscious into the dream state and increases the chances of waking up at that time naturally. And if you do it enough, you train your whole body to respond to that specific time. We have our own internal clock, of sorts, so it works well. Much better than artificial alarms, at least for me, since I always hit the snooze at least five times if I have to set an actual alarm. Don't like that. Case notes are file 1380, The Phantom Prescription. 
So yes, I do believe it was a positive turn of events. Maybe it is just a random glitch that just happened to benefit her. I am not much for pharmaceuticals personally. I think a natural approach is generally the best, barring extreme cases like chemotherapy to treat cancer, or medication to deal with your body's lowered immune state if you're in surgery or something like that, yeah. Also, addiction is one of the other beasts that is never really spoken about in the hospital, like receiving morphine. No thanks, yes, it works at suppressing pain, but then I'd be afraid of being addicted. I really am lucky though, I've never needed to go to the hospital before. Not for myself anyways. Cherish your good health if you have it. Quesant Sofal, 1381. Father unleashes spirit magic on skeptical teen. Very interesting story. So how could he know? How could your dad have known? The only thing I can possibly think of is he has cameras in your room that somehow have resolution to zoom in on what you wrote down, <laughs> but that seems quite far-fetched and rather dark too. Of course, that he has this incredible ability to read minds is just as difficult to accept, especially because it sounds like he has proper control over it. Most stories I read where people have this kind of gift can't control it, it just happens to them. This is another level entirely, truly X-Men level stuff, wow. Okay, so for the bonus file. Luminous Orbs by the Seaside Woods. This sounds more alien than spiritual to me. So you think about ball lightning, or as we like to think about it, spiritual orbs. Definitely they emit light, usually more blue, sometimes green or orange. And don't involve feelings of dread or terror. Though people sometimes are apprehensive, of course, because they don't know what the hell it is. Nor are they usually in large groupings like this, moving together. Hmm. So aliens? Maybe. Perhaps a ship of which you could only make out the light fixtures. That could explain the dread as well. And why they were gone when you came back. And now time for the quote of the day. A compliment is a gift not to be thrown away carelessly, unless you want to hurt the giver. Eleanor Hamilton. You know, I've been trying to give out more compliments lately. And I don't think people expect it. These days it's pretty rare. To just compliment someone for something true that you think is pretty cool about them with no ulterior motive, just because you think it makes sense to say. That positive reinforcement, it translates over time, it ripples out, it amplifies. If people carry it forward, well, there's no telling how much a single compliment can change the world. Give it a try. And yes, if you are complimented, say thank you. That kind of positivity should be reciprocated. Case Sofa, 1382. The unforgettable day a book called my name. Can objects be imbued with our own spiritual energy? If the soul can be ripped or maybe chipped off is the better analogy on death, the fragment left behind represents the soul while the rest moves to another universe, represents the spirit. Well, what if those fragments can imbibe within an object, like a book? This could account for the rare experience of cursed objects. Maybe it's no curse at all. Merely the will expressed from that fading soul still tethered to an object. And it would explain how you felt called to it. It was literally pulling you in. Spiritually whispering to you. Amazing how many allegories this kind of thought can tether to in our folk tales and fiction. Lord of the Rings, for example, of course. Though in this case, on a far more positive note. Not pure evil within a ring. <laughs> Case notes for the bonus file. The combat-ready ghost in my military barracks. Given the manipulation of all the gear in the barracks, my impression is this ghostly soldier thought it belonged to him. Indeed, given that it was his old bunk, it makes sense. With the extreme trauma of death in explosive combat, it doesn't surprise me at all that part of him remained behind. Actually, what surprises me more is why there aren't more soldier spirits around. Lingering on the battlefield and in their barracks and so on, things that would connect them to the event that killed them. I mean, given that nature of their death, so traumatic, I'd imagine all these places to be hotbeds for this kind of paranormal activity. I wonder why not. Hmm. Maybe there's a geographical limit to how many spirits can exist within a certain area. Like atoms, they can't occupy an area too close or too far, depending on magnetic alignment and proximity. So if too many are in an area, Maybe the pole shift. There could be a kind of spiritual force that keeps spirits away from each other, or in some cases maybe pulls them together. Just like magnetism. And your first sergeant's reaction screams to me that he knew right off the bat you weren't lying. He just couldn't accept it initially. It was too painful. Needed a moment to process it. And now time for the quote of the day. 
When everyone is against you, it means that you are absolutely wrong or absolutely right. Albert Guinan Reminds me of the Albert Einstein quote as well of, Why a hundred people against me? If I'm wrong, one would suffice. People are safe in numbers, of course, and if you have the same opinion as a tribe, you'll feel more at ease. It's very difficult. There's actually an experiment, a social experiment done on this. It's called the ASCH, A-S-C-H. And the point of the study was to determine if someone, an individual, just one person, knew something was wrong, would they have the mental fortitude and just the audacity in a certain frame of reference um, to go against the group? So the study was there'd be a classroom, the teacher and all the other students would be in on it, just one person wasn't. And the teacher would ask a question and then people would answer with incorrect answers and the teacher would agree with them and say, yeah, this is the correct answer. So how many people would be willing to say, you know, when they're asked their turn, what is the correct answer? How many people would be willing to say, that's the incorrect answer, this is the correct answer? When the entire classroom and the teacher agree, this is it, it's X, are you willing to say Y? If, you're, if you know to your core that it's correct. Most people won't. And that's not, it's not really a judgment on them. It makes perfect sense in evolution because most of our being is about fitting in with the tribe. It was so powerful to be connected with other people in that way, connect with their thoughts and the group's opinion because they were just safer in numbers. So rocking the boat, so to speak, was not a strong strategy in terms of survival. So most people are not evolved for that. It's very rare. To have people that are willing to say, no, the answer is why. Of course, that doesn't mean that if everyone is against you that you're always correct. So that's the other issue is having the ability to stand up for yourself and say what you believe is true, even against everyone, but also the ability to introspect and analyze your own thoughts and opinions and say, okay, am I actually correct? That balance, always back to balance, right? <laughs> but that balance is not easy to pull off. But hey, if you're at least, if you have the baseline ability to stand up against the crowd, against the group, there's a lot of potential in that. It's something very important because if everyone is just yes men agreeing with the group, then there could be serious flaws in that because maybe the group is wrong. And if it is, then everyone's basically walking off a cliff because other people are too. That's not good. <laughs> Quesantifa 1383, The Wolf Guardian's Silent Warning. I wonder at what point in our culture did wolves start to be perceived as a negative omen? If you think about it, it's rather odd. Wolves have been part of human society well before the agricultural revolution, when we were no more than hunter-gatherers tens of thousands of years ago. Keep the good ones around, content from our scraps, but providing excellent guardianship. In fact, if I had to pick an animal that best represent guardianship for humans, it'd be a wolf or in our cases now, domesticated dogs. But yeah, I don't know when that crossover happened. And sadly, this has nothing to do with the Dave we all know and love. But that's okay. Dave can just chill out. Okay, so notes for the bonus file. Decades of mystery. So these are definitive signs of a real human being occupying the space, giving them missing food. Spirits need energy, but not from the chemical processes of food. However, moving into another place with another human squatter? What a strange confluence there. What are the odds of living in two different places that both are either haunted or both occupied by a human squatter? Or one is haunted and then one is a squatter? That's very unlikely, right? But I guess it could happen. Very, uh, unfortunate, I guess? Yeah. Hmm. Case notes for the bonus file. I met my grandmother's ghost in a red trench coat. So first, I'm just happy to hear that you've had such a good support system along the way. A mom that believes you, and now a husband just as keenly interested in your abilities and perception. Man, trying to imagine that though, you have a child that can see your own mother when you never had the chance to even say goodbye. And of course, you know it can't be some subconscious fluke because your child has never met your mother, your, her grandmother. I mean, if that isn't concrete evidence of the supernatural, the otherworldly, what is? If a child sees someone you know is dead that you loved, but they never saw them, they never met, there's no, there's no pictures. It's impossible. I mean, what are the odds of someone imagining someone, the possible combinations of a face and the clothing that someone would wear? It's almost infinite. So no, this is concrete evidence, and in such a wholesome way. And now time for the quote of the day. This is the saving grace of humor. 
If you fail, no one is laughing at you. A. Whitney Brown. I ah, yes, the uh, consolation prize of nothing but stares, empty, silent, judging you. Is anyone else afraid of speaking in it to a crowd? Not just as a comedian, but just in general? You have this idea that you get up there, you say your piece, you express yourself, and then everyone is just like, okay, so was that it? <laughs> Do you have anything else, or we're just going to kind of stare blankly at you? Now that is the stuff of pure terror. Case notes file 1384. My dad and I saw a flying car. So without more details, it's kind of hard to comment on this. All I can think is, something must have been on the road to have caused the energy to flip from its own kinetic energy, the car's flip. But even that doesn't really explain it, does it? I mean, no other car is affected behind it, so it couldn't be something stuck to the road. The only thing I can think of, I saw a video a while ago, really unfortunate for the person involved, but they were on the freeway, and there's a truck on the right side of this SUV, and one of the wheels, it had two wheels I guess, it just breaks off, or maybe it had just one wheel, I don't know, but I know the truck kept driving, but one of the wheels in the front lost its bolts I guess, then kept rolling, and it rolled into the lane of the SUV, who rolled over it, and I guess the momentum of the angular velocity of the wheel propelled the car upwards, literally flipped over basically kind of what you described, almost like a flip onto itself, over itself, just from a wheel that broke off like that. I, did, I would not have expected a car could do that, but I guess it makes some sense. There's energy that's propelling it because the wheel is spinning, so it's pushing up, and then its own, the own kin uh, kinetic energy of the car lifted off the ground, propelled itself, flipped over, and what could cause a wheel to just lose out like that? It's kind of crazy. Was there some influence from some other unseen entity? I don't know. Maybe it's just bad luck, but damn. <laughs> Very unfortunate. Case on so far, 1385. The Aliens of Fire. So I'm sure other people are getting this too, but there's heavy Independence Day vibes from this experience. And you know, that's something that movie got right, at least as far as we understand physics now. If a ship was capable of coming into our atmosphere at high velocity, the atmosphere around the ship would be superheated, and the ship too, unless they have some method to remove heat almost instantly, but maybe these aliens do not, and maybe there's just no way, physically speaking, no matter how advanced you get, that heat is just spread into the atmosphere. Or maybe it's a government craft that's automated, no one inside, which would explain how the g-forces don't matter, to an extent. I mean, if you get enough g-forces, you can literally rip the craft apart, but Assuming there's really strong alloys that we don't know about, yeah, maybe you could have really high G movements. So it really comes down to special alloys and automation, which we can automate drones, why not an entire craft? I think it's possible. So maybe it was an aliens, so maybe it is just our own government test. But it could be aliens too. <laughs> I won't discount that. Okay, so notes for the bonus file. Casino Rama's Dark Secret. So gambling addiction is no joke. Can leave people as down and out as any drug. Hopeless and lifeless. It sounds like you recovered though, so I'm happy about that. It's mightily impressive. As far as the rodent, well, a curious spirit possessing a rodent or perhaps causing a hallucination of it? Maybe. Can't say too much on it beyond that though. It did sound almost like it was apathetic to you, didn't really care. Maybe slightly curious, but that's it. Now time for the quote of the day. We are so accustomed to disguise ourselves to others that in the end we become disguised to ourselves. François de la Rochefoucauld. Yes, that's the ultimate mask, isn't it? The mask we wear to hide ourselves from ourselves. Maybe because we're not proud of who we are, the choices we made, a lot of guilt and regret. It adds up, and then you're just not happy with who you are. Now, the beautiful thing about being human is you can always change who you are. You can't change your past and the choices you made. But you can start to forgive yourself, but only... This, is, this only works if you actually genuinely are trying to change and don't go back to your old ways. If you forgive yourself but you never change, well that's a recipe for continuing the same behavior because you'll just say, you'll just go back to what you were doing that was bad. So if you're wearing a mask because you're not proud of who you are or the choices you made in the past, be introspective. Think about what were those things that you did wrong and why you made those choices. The why is critical. Because if you don't understand the why, you're going to make the same mistake again. You're going to choose it again without even really understanding. That's no good. Okay, so far, 1386. 
The Strange Temporal Episode on the San Mateo Bridge I was curious, so I looked up the length of that bridge, I've never seen it before, and it stands at 7 miles or almost 12 kilometers long. Damn. That's a lengthy bridge indeed. But even with a bit of traffic, I can't see it taking more than 10-15 minutes to cross. Certainly not an hour. Some kind of portal system? Where the vectors repeated into themselves. It's like in that portal game, where you have a device that generates a portal wherever you aim, but you can select where the exit portal is as well. So people did all kinds of goofy things with it, including an entry portal on the floor and an exit portal on the ceiling above. So you'd enter the entry portal, then fall out from the ceiling, from the exit portal on the ceiling, into the entry portal again, in an infinite loop. Or it's like the scene in one of the Marvel movies where Loki is stuck in the portal where he keeps falling through himself. (laughs) That's uh, basically the same thing. Only in this case, it would be not through gravity, but just continually driving through the portal without realizing it. And these portals in real life, they're invisible. Unless they're unstable, is my guess. I think there's been a couple instances where people have seen them, but I think they just collapse. They emit light before they're going to collapse, is my guess. But if they're stable, then you don't even see them. And given the sameness of a bridge, I could believe that you could go through a portal several times without even realizing it, because the environments are basically the same. If there's not enough traffic, you wouldn't really notice anything different. You would just be... It would be be so instantaneous and seamless that, yeah, I, I, I think that explains it very well. A portal where there are two portals that are intersected in vectors. So you enter one, exit behind, enter it back again, Stuck in a space loop. I don't think it was relevant with time itself, just space. Of course, the question really is still the same. What the hell causes these? Is it an anomaly? Is it something that is just random? It seems too precise to be random to me, but I have no idea what could cause it. Government tests? Weird place to conduct a test, I really don't know. Case notes for the file 1387. When a mysterious photographer interrupts a drive. To me, this screams of a dare by the driver of that black SUV, urging their passenger to try and freak out whoever was driving behind them. Maybe they didn't like how close your husband was driving? Tailgating? Still, a very odd way to go about things. If that is indeed what prompted this mysterious photography session. Okay, Sonsofal 1388. The Synchronized Family Dinner Glitch. Ah yes, the great zucchini superposition. (laughs) I think the last line is a dead giveaway. More glitches lately. This indicates a failure to re-render properly from a multiverse trip. Your very code is corrupted or incomplete, which for some reason generates errors in the local environment around you. In this case, someone in your family at that dinner table had recently returned from a different universe, and their presence there destabilized the environment, including the food. So, simply enough, the youngest child received extra yellow zucchini and taters from a different version of herself in a different universe, and over there, She didn't even have to finish the first serving. (laughs) So just fish all night. Not bad. Salmon's pretty good. And now time for the quote of the day. The argument from intimidation is a confession of intellectual impotence. Ayn Rand. I think this definitely applies, but I think it, it can expand it a bit to go that the problem is people aren't coming to discussions and debates as individuals most of the time. They're coming as part of a team, a tribe, as we spoke a few days ago, where The whole idea is to fit in with your tribe. You select a tribe, a team, Democrat, Republican, whatever it may be. Could be a sports team too, or whatever the topic. There's usually groups and teams involved. The issues themselves largely don't matter. It's just about rhetoric. And is your rhetoric better? Your team's rhetoric better than the other teams? But you're not going to get anywhere productive if that's how you approach things. I mean, you can belong to a team. I think we all want to, to some extent, but you have to approach these discussions as an individual trying to expand their own knowledge. It's so difficult, though. And if you don't do that, honestly, you'll just use any rhetoric device that you can, including intimidation or insults or petty bickering high school behavior, (laughs) bullying even. It is unfortunate. But it's not easy to correct. And I mean, I don't have all the answers. I don't know how to calm things down. And I mean, it's been especially bad since 2016. And you can notice this, I think, with how many debates you can find online. The amount of good, wholesome debates where people are willing to just agree to disagree, even though the issues are hot and important. 
very hard to find these days. I think we'll know things are getting back to normal when there's more debates about. And people are respectful, relatively respectful. Obviously, emotions can get heated, but they can keep themselves relatively friendly. If you can get to that point again, then I think there's potential. But right now, <laughs> it's kind of a mess. Hmm. Case notes are file 1389. Why does my dad sit alone every night in his car? I wonder if your father was using the car as his man cave of sorts. How your mom or sister never noticed, that's hard to say. Maybe your mom didn't want it to seem like their marriage was shaky, or that your dad needed space. But it wouldn't explain why your sister never noticed. If it's a doppelganger, maybe seeing a father from a different universe? But I mean, the question would still be the same, even if it's happening in a different universe. Why is he doing that? Just a classic mystery of the human condition. Case Notes of 1390. The Intruder's Riddle. Of all the violent human gangs around, or supernatural monsters or glitches, nothing makes me more unsettled than a home invasion or break-in, or even if it's a glitch, anything affecting you in your home, where you're supposed to, you know, it's supposed to be your own little castle. Without your permission, something happening is very violating. Especially when you can't even imagine how the break-in or glitch happened. You can't feel safe again, or at least it would take a long time to. I don't envy this experience, whatever the cause. Case on file 1391, The Sinister Swings. So this is a shared spidey sense, you could say, and it's there's been a few accounts of this where people are close together and they get the same sense of dread and fear and like, oh crap, we have to leave really quickly. There was some kind of entity in that area, no doubt about that. Even the sense of the air going cold or feeling wrong, it's a feeling induced by your own subconscious to get you to pay attention and not ignore the warning. Kind of like pain is our own signal to not ignore something wrong with the body. Well, if there's something in the local environment, the body, the mind is going to definitely let you know. So listen to it. Don't ignore it. Okay, so file 1392. From the dance floor to the crash site. Indeed, this strikes me as an erratic escape attempt or maybe a rapid delivery of some kind of item or substance that they weren't meant to be found with. Organized crime, maybe? It is very weird, but I don't know if there's anything supernatural involved. Maybe with the girl that answered the door. And now time for the quote of the day. I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. Albert Einstein. Well, if you define ourselves as purely stats that are independent from anything we've invented, then yeah, we're definitely getting dumber. Try doing math without a calculator or a computer. Maybe you can do a bit, but it's not going to be as efficient, that's for sure, and certainly not as efficient as people were in 1940. I think as long as the technology is used with some wisdom, and that's the key, then we can do great things with it. AI now is reaching a point where it can do so many incredible things. But I think it's important not to let AI be used as a main course. It's kind of like in cooking. Right now, we have AI, and we can use it to produce extremely delicious spices, herbs, and things that can enhance or maybe help with the preparation of meat and stuff. But it shouldn't be the core focus. You know, it should, it should enhance our ability to create and to prosper. But it can't be in of itself the end goal. Because if it is, then yeah, I do envision a future, say, like Wally, -E, where we're just in a chair. <laughs> we're being fed and taken care of by our robot creations that are powered by AI and we don't have to do anything ourselves. And that sounds good on paper, but it destroys and melts the soul. It's not what we actually want. Kind of like the old adage of be careful what you wish for, because there's definitely unintended consequences. Case Notes of 1393. The night aliens invaded our Hawaiian retreat. So as exciting as aliens are, these days I'm more and more inclined to think that UFOs that we see are government experiments. I think aliens wouldn't ever be seen unless they wanted to be. That said, maybe this tech is reverse engineered from crashed alien aircraft. I think those pieces kind of fit well enough into reality. Could also be Project Bluebeam stuff where the government is faking alien aircraft, UFOs meant to be seen or thought of as alien aircraft, but they're not real. They're just holographic projections, maybe drone swarms or something. If it is a real aircraft or a ship, that can't quite explain how this technology violates current laws of physics, though. Even if we built it ourselves, even if no aliens are involved at all, 100% on us, 
How can any aircraft travel faster than the speed of sound, and then there be no sonic boom? That's the current mystery surrounding UFOs, and also the instantaneous acceleration. Not even if it's human or alien tech, but just how the technology itself can be so foreign and alien to us. If it is real, that's the only concern you think. If it's just a, a trickery, made to look like an alien aircraft, but it's, or just an experimental craft, but it's not, that would suck. But if it's real, then just knowing that you can violate the known laws of physics, which just means that we don't understand them fully, is quite exciting to me. Okay, so for the bonus file. The black mass that haunted our road. Visual echoes from other dimensions. Light can be emitted without anything being there that we can interact with directly, or rather in this case, the absence of light. This isn't even hard to fit into our currently known physics, with dark matter being this nebulous mass that has no interaction with physical matter or energy in this dimension. The only thing we know about it is that it has gravity. It has an effect on space-time itself, but that's it. Nothing else, apparently. So whatever you saw almost certainly exists, but nowhere that we have access to. So it wasn't a threat, it's just an anomaly in why you saw it. Now time for the quote of the day. To me, a lush carpet of pine needles or spongy grass is more welcome than the most luxurious Persian rug. Helen Keller. I'm actually wondering, did you guys go camping much during your childhood and teenage years? I did go quite a few times with my dad and uh, I think once with my grandparents, though not often. And you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be camping. It could just be having a cabin in the woods and a lot of privacy and of course a backyard, an extensive backyard where there's trees and the cricket sounds and the smell of wood burning with your little fire pit. You don't have to be out in the wilderness, I guess, for that. But yeah, just laying on the ground on a cool evening night, it's precious. Now, is that more luxurious than the Persian rug? I don't know. I can see value in both, but I really understand where this quote is coming from. A return to nature, in many ways, would be good. Or at least a vacation into it. <laughs> Case Notes of 1394, the night I defied death on Sunset Boulevard. It's been a hot minute since I narrated a quantum immortality story, but to me they never get old. It signals a logical and physical way how life can persist even through the standard mortal coil that we all experience daily. So here we have the complete package. Not just seamless quantum immortality, which is more common, but the version where you're temporarily stuck in a limbo universe with no other souls, a dead copy, until full transfer is finished to your new vessel in a real universe. Most people never perceive this limbo area. The limbo area would be extremely distressing though, if perceived, especially if you don't know about glitches. You've never heard of this happening to anyone, so yeah, <laughs> being stuck where there's no other humans around randomly is not normal for most people. Que sont 1395. When Josh defied time and space. Teleportation events are spooky because of how flawless the transitions usually are. One plank length, you're at X coordinates, and the next plank length, you're at Y. There's no airburst, no sonic boom, no heat displacement from the air moving out of the way at such high speeds it turns into plasma. Because of course if you're teleporting in one, one spot there's no atmosphere at all, because you just vanished, all your mass is gone, and then in the new area, you have to move all that air out of the way. It's not a void, you're in the atmosphere. So there's nothing like that at all, which is strange, right? It's like the universe itself opens a void prior to accepting the teleportation, and it all happens so fast, no one has a perception of it. Maybe you disappear in one spot, there's a void, and then the universe takes the air that would be in the area you're going to be ported to, and this is all with like time frozen, and it just moves that air into the area where you were before, the void you created by disappearing, and it all happens instantaneously. So there's no air burst, there's no, there's no noise. A couple times, there were a couple stories where there were. So I don't know, maybe teleportations or returning items and stuff, it's not all the same thing. There's different ways it can happen. Because there's different contextual clues that tell us, yeah, sometimes there is an air burst, there is a sonic boom, because the air has to move out of the way. And sometimes, most of the time, there isn't. So I guess there's a higher level controller going on in those, the majority of the cases. Hmm. But to me, this doesn't strike me as an ability that someone has. Okay, so 1396, the cemetery, 15 years later. I wonder when, what sounds like a mausoleum, when was it constructed? 
Was it happening 15 years ago, while you were having the dream? It's unlikely your uncle actually built it, but my guess would be you were dreaming about your uncle's final resting place being built, and your subconscious merely interpreted it as your uncle building it himself. I'm not sure why your subconscious would do that, but it seems like the most logical explanation. Now time for the quote of the day. The weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Mahatma Gandhi. It takes a lot of strength to forgive, but there's only one caveat I want to include to this, is that forgiveness, there's one thing that has to precede forgiving someone. You have to know that they're willing to truly change. Not just saying, I'm sorry, but look at their actions. Like they say, actions speak louder than words. Are their actions reflecting an actual desire to change? If they harmed you in some way, but they intend truly never to do it again, it was a mistake, a weakness of character, okay, you can forgive them. One time. I don't think you should forgive someone twice. I think once, some people deserve a second chance if they show that they're really going to honor that second chance, but otherwise don't. So forgiveness is a sign of strength if you do it wisely. It can be a sign of naivete if you forgive someone over and over or forgive someone with no evidence that they're going to change. That I would say is not wise. Case Notes of 1397. I cheated death on an impossible road. Had you not closed your eyes, I think you'd have experienced that seamless form of teleportation that sometimes occurs to people randomly via space-time portals. So perhaps the same mechanism is involved in quantum immortality. Maybe the portals aren't random. Maybe those space-time portals exist in areas where people died and had their soul moved to another universe. Maybe an actual portal has to be created, and that portal persists after the person dies. I don't know for how long, but not forever. We know they're unstable. But yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Kind of a light bulb or a Dave above your head. <laughs> Interesting. Case Notes of 1398. My lost toy returns after two decades. If an entity was trying to return the toy to you, why put it down the vent again, where you possibly might never see it again? Or did the object somehow tether to you, almost like a magnetic leash? One thing is for sure, it was connected to you. It's just odd that it returned in the same way that it was lost. That seems random, and yet it seems impossible to be random. It's almost like you willed it to return, subconsciously, but the subconscious was drawn by the memory of where you had lost it, so it returned in the same way that it was lost. Case notes file 1399. Woman and dog vanish. What really happened? I always like when stores allow pets inside. Feels more natural. Although you have to be careful of multiple pets potentially being hostile or doing their business inside, so I understand why most stores don't permit it. So at first I thought, oh, what an unlikely coincidence. The black lady left at the same time as the man, so the chimes coalesced together and you only heard one, and also the Asian lady came in at the same time with the dog as well. But since you had the view of both doors, that can't be it. And even if it was it, that would be such a confluence of events, it would be almost supernatural in of itself. I guess it's multiversal sight, must be. The black lady came into the store in a different universe, and you were seeing there for a brief moment. It is unusual, but it does happen. And that would definitely explain this. And now time for the quote of the day. Personality can open doors, but only character can keep them open. Elmer G. Letterman. It's funny, this is kind of like uh, YouTube, where if you make a video, the thumbnail is what pulls you in, or the title too, and then the content of the video is what keeps you here. If the content isn't very good, people don't watch for long, and it's not a great video. So it's the same thing, really, in real life. You have your external persona, and your, your image, your personality, but are you a good person inside? Do you keep your promises? Do you keep to your word? Your word is your bond, as they say. If people know they can depend on you to be trustworthy and honorable, then yeah, they're going to want to stick around. Why wouldn't you? That's someone you can actually depend on. Someone you can trust almost as much as you trust yourself. That's very rare. If you get that impression from someone after spending a long time with them, they're going to want to keep you around. That's for sure. So be that person. Case notes of file, 1400. I prevented the zombie apocalypse with ranch dressing. So I think dreams can include additional information about our environment and, yes, decoded by your subconscious. And this can include even information from the future. You can think of it as the subconscious being the CPU and our conscious mind being the monitor, at least in part. Subconscious is processing information, decoding it, organizing it, 
And then it's fed into this conscious mind where you perceive it like a screen. I think the conscious mind does more than just see, but it's a large part of what it does is to enable our experience of reality, or dreams in this case. Now that said, I don't think that the decoding process is perfect. There can be anomalies or fantastical embellishments, such as in the case with zombies. <laughs> so I don't think if you had ordered the ranch normally, that there would have been actual zombies. Maybe the people would have been violent. Maybe it would somehow signal a crossing of a universe into where those three men enter and they're just taken over by rabies or something. <laughs> Very unlikely, but still possible. Unlikely, in my view, that it would be real zombies, but I guess who knows. Best to prepare ourselves just in case. <laughs> And hey, maybe it's not silver or decapitation that we need, we just need ranch dressing. That is the real enemy of zombies. You learn something new every day, huh? <laughs> okay, Sansufa, 1401. The fire that revived itself. I think this is a pure case of temporal reset, but only in the very small, local area surrounding the fire itself. It had to be a temporal reset before it started to rain because no human could have restarted the fire otherwise, at least not unless they brought their own dry wood and kindling. I've tried to start fires countless times when camping, and it just doesn't work if the wood and ground is wet. The water steals too much thermal energy to get a good spark and then fire going from it. You definitely need dryness for that to happen. There's no possible way I can think of that it would restart itself after being doused with water from a bucket and then being rained on too. And I don't think it was some external threat either, I think it was just a temporal anomaly. And it's not too far-fetched for what we know about space-time portals, I guess it was just a time-based portal in this case. Focus more on time. Maybe the fire pit actually itself moved slightly as well, but the primary movement was in time. Case notes are filed 1402. There's a reason my rent is so cheap. Hidden beneath the surface of our everyday lives. Yep, a succinct way to put it. The memory starting to fade sort of reminds me of Back to the Future, where the very photograph image of himself starts to be erased, as if it never happened, as if he never existed. Temporal paradoxes definitely are a head-scratcher. So in my mind, this sounds like a developer in the real world of this simulation noticed the error and tried to correct it, even in your own memory. Although, I guess that's not so simple to do. And now time for the quote of the day. We are indeed much more than what we eat, but what we eat can nevertheless help us to be much more than what we are. Adele Davis. Yeah, that simple adage of you are what you eat. Kind of true, but it's much more than just that. Of course, if you eat healthy food, whole foods is the key. Generally whole foods. But you know, <laughs> I'm not a stickler to that. I think the key is to not be overweight. If you're overweight, there's a lot of health issues that come along with that. And the key to me is just walking more. Still want to enjoy delicious foods. Uh, <laughs> there's so many good foods out there. Pastries are my weakness. Donuts and turnovers and puff pastries filled with raspberry jam or whatever it is. Oh my, that sounds pretty good right now. It doesn't mean you can never eat delicious junk food like that. Just shouldn't be the bulk of your diet if that's all you're eating. Probably not going to end well for you. So. Incorporate a lot of whole foods in it, you know, lean meats, fish, vegetables, fruits, legumes, all that good stuff. You'll be full without eating as many calories, and if you walk as well in addition to that, you'll definitely lose weight if that's a goal of yours. Okay, Sansafa, 1403. Morrowin Mystery. The Khajiit Intruder. I never played Morrowin myself, but I hear it's a massive game. So I'll postulate two theories here. Either one of your friends was playing a prank, had his own save file ported into a portable memory stick, which they had back in the day. I remember them being translucent. You could actually see through it into the memory chip. That was pretty cool. And via that, just imported his own save file into your system as a way to prank you, I guess, to make you think, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> and if so, that definitely worked. The other option is simple that it was a file from a different universe, one where you made that character yourself and obviously quite different from your current characters, because you never played Khajiit. But over there you did, and somehow the file came over here. And the files are just data. That kind of transfer process, I think, would be rather simple, relative to actually moving a whole body or a soul over. Okay, Sansafa, 1404. The time-bending hellos. So, temporal greetings. But I think it's your perception that's heightened. Less to do with anyone else. But then, why is it just hearing people's ripples across time? 
For instance, why not experience a TV show ahead of time, or cooking, or anything else? It's very peculiar that it's so specifically focused on greetings or just hearing footsteps, something so related to other people in your life. That to me tells me that it's something that is controlled subconsciously, which in theory means you could possibly control this in your conscious mind, which would be incredible, but I have no idea how you would even try to train yourself to do that. Quesant Sofa, 1405. A bizarre incident of psychic retrieval. So I wonder, are we able to imbue part of our soul within objects? It's kind of like in Harry Potter with the Horcrux, but in this case, not requiring murder. <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day in regards to supposedly cursed objects, where it may in fact just be an object that has spiritual energy infused into it, which can make it do funky things depending on whose soul it took on. But maybe too, this can happen prior to a person's death. If you're still alive, but an object has a sprinkle of your soul, let's say, would you be bound to it? Subconsciously tethered? It would explain how objects often find their way back to their owners, and sometimes in weird spots like where they disappeared from, or in this case, how you found the object because it was like it was calling to you, it was a part of you. How the soul gets infused into an item, I'm not sure, maybe it's simply, simply proximity, the more you hold it, the more you interact with it, the more you think about it, something like that. Would make sense. And now time for the quote of the day. Agent Smith. You must be able to see it, Mr. Anderson. You must know it by now. You can't win. It's pointless to keep fighting. Why, Mr. Anderson? Why? Why do you persist? Neo. Because I choose to. And that is the ultimate expression of life, and the whole meaning and purpose, if there is one, is our own ability to choose, to transcend cause and effect, which was a lot of the purpose of the movie itself, the Matrix trilogy is all cause and effect with the Frenchman and all that, right? Um, that we can be above that, that we can make irrational choices, that we can do anything we want, that we simply choose to do, is almost divine. And I don't even necessarily say that in a religious context, it's more to say that it transcends what we understand of reality, because as we understand it, everything is basically a complex series of dominoes. Now if we're if we truly have free will, that breaks the mold. Now yes, at the fundamental quantum level, things are random and unpredictable, but that still wouldn't exactly give us free will, it would just mean we can't be predicted. If we actually have free will, ungoverned by anything in the universe, well, that sure is something special. And we should definitely appreciate that, because there's nothing else like it. Quesant Sofa, 1406, The Rainfall Wizard. So there is a weather phenomenon called localized precipitation, where rain can seem to target a specific place, almost like a water gun from a child. But this is the inverse of that, more like a tiny eye of the hurricane. Could I believe this is a natural weather phenomenon? Maybe. If it didn't follow the both of you. You went back, you went forward, it always followed you. That's targeted. Was it perhaps some advanced test of technology? An experimental weather device that could actually control the direction of clouds, or how they precipitate? One way or another, if it's technology or nature itself, something was controlling it. Okay, sounds for the bonus file. The strange cat in the dead of night. Ah yes, ashes in the walls. Never heard of someone doing that before, but I guess if you want to be... If you want to stay really close to someone that you loved. But it would explain why he was bound to that spot, although... The common theme in most fiction is that burning the remains would release the spirit from this dimension that was bound to his own remains. Maybe that's false? Or maybe you do need to have salt as well. If that's the case, we should alert all the crematoriums to include salt in their process. <laughs> Just to be safe. Thing is, the sounds you all heard, my guess is your grandpa is there in the spiritual plane, between ours and the beyond, unable to affect this world much, but is training trying to master his ability to influence the living world. Maybe time itself doesn't pass at the same rate too, which is why from his perspective, there isn't much going on. But from ours, it seems like constant repetition in the same place, like scratches on the door. The slight wrinkle in this theory is where you heard the scratches on the door. Why practice it so low down on the door, a quarter of the way up, instead of his natural height, unless he was extremely short, but I don't think that was the case. And now time for the quote of the day. To predict the behavior of ordinary people in advance, you only have to assume that they will always try to escape a disagreeable situation with the smallest possible expenditure of intelligence.
Friedrich Nietzsche. Ah yes, the smallest amount of expenditure of intelligence, or also energy. Humans seek out the path of least resistance that's common throughout all of human history. It's very rare to go against that. And to be fair, we wouldn't exist if we didn't have that instinct. It's preserved our species. Don't knock it, even though you have to try to adapt against it in modern life. And much in the same way that you want to go out of your way to hone your body through extra stress by running, by lifting weights, to the same end, you want to hone your mind by adding stress to it. Challenge yourself to debates, read books, always test your brain, push it as far as you can, because that will develop. And who doesn't want a powerful brain? That's just fun. Okay, so let's 1407. The Drive Beyond Time and Space. So the important detail from this story is how the numbers and letters seem to coalesce together on the dashboard, as if your mind was unable to process reality because in, as you say, it was all discombobulated, or rather, joined together. Quantum immortality is a seamless event though, minus sometimes being stuck in a limbo universe. This is the first time hearing about this kind of discombobulation event, mixed in with quantum immortality. Maybe it was something else entirely, but what else could it be? Perhaps a case of a guardian angel directly interfering, and somehow, by possessing you, your conscious mind wasn't able to understand what was going on. I'm just trying to make it make sense as how the information that you were reading didn't fit. Case on to file 1408. The McDonald's Mandela Mystery. That is usually the telltale sign of quantum immortality, when a small detail differs from what you expect. Is this always the case for the Mandela effect, or can details from within a universe itself retroactively change? So maybe it's not always the case that we're moving universes, maybe there is actually corrections happening, and only some people are able to perceive it. The latter is much more disturbing, in my view. Okay, so for the bonus file. The day the cemetery held us captive. So I think the act of being locked in was meant as a prank, probably from rowdy teenagers in the area that just snuck in. By the way, Never heard of cemetery with guards. That's actually rather respectful, in my opinion. Outside of the veterans memorial, there's always an armed guard there, but otherwise if it's just normal people. But I do think the dead should be honored in that way, at least in memory. Even if most of them aren't around anymore, in spirit. But to escape, it sounds like your grandma was temporarily possessed by a spirit. In that area, there are a few around, I imagine. Though it's unclear how they would have known the combination to the lock. That is interesting, so it's only part of the puzzle. Now time for the quote of the day. Books to the ceiling, books to the sky. My pile of books is a mile high. How I love them, how I need them. I'll have a long beard by the time I read them. Arnold Lobel. You know how I've painted the picture of having a cabin in the woods, you know, a crackling fire in the winter. That's all great, and that's the dream. But also, having a bunch of books. But real books, not just on, you know, that you read digitally. They have to be physical books. Just the smell of the paper alone sends you back in the past, and it's a wild ride. There's nothing like it. If you haven't been reading hardcover books, like with real pages in it, I recommend it. Even if it's just fantasy. You know, you don't have to do it in a way to, to always be stressing your mind out or anything, like self-help books or knowledge-based books. Those are good too, but if you just want to have a good time and relax, it's great. Actually, if you struggle to go to bed, the best advice is to, maybe an hour or two before going to bed, before you want to go to bed, just drop all the digital devices and read. That really does the trick, it calms your mind down. Unless it's the most intense book ever written, maybe pick something a bit more mellow. <laughs> like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.